feel like All right. we're going to start recording anyways. Let's get that on. You're making it awkward. Hell yeah. Hold on, is it? Who Let me brought make this sure. dad versus cargo shorts in his... <laughs> what are they? Assess... What are the... What's the shoes called? What's Why are you shoe? wearing a sweater inside? <laughs> Let me make sure it's actually... It's camo, how do you even see him? I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, where, it, where do you go? That acorn, bro. It's really hiding you. Alright, we're good. We're good. See him looking at our voice compared to his. Oh, yeah. Getting ready to talk about the legend of Boogie Creek <laughs> and the fuck monster. Shut the fuck up! <laughs> God damn it! Talk. Like, how does he hit those bars? How does that feel? Like? <laughs> Ooh. Mm. Ooh. <laughs> You're listening to another episode of the Ranger Gareth Podcast, where we discuss environmental news and interview the finest minds in the ecosphere. I'm Gareth, former park ranger and current conservationist. Today, my guests are Dan Parker and Wayne Ferguson, two of my oldest friends and two very prominent Bigfoot enthusiasts. Today, we're going to talk about the most fucked up Bigfoot stories in history. I'd also like to thank our sponsors that don't exist, but if you see us drinking anything out of any cans during this video... Feel free to sponsor us, because I need the money. Our one and only sponsor to date, 780 Pizza, the creator of Driz Pizza Sauce. Driz Pizza Sauce. Put it on your pizza, get it on your face. <laughs> Pretty sure he's talking about semen. I, God damn it. <laughs> no, no, Driz. Is this an actual pizza place? Yeah. <laughs> if, if you have money, give it to me, please. It's, it's Maloney. <laughs> Oh, fuck. There's no money, bro. Every, God damn it. Every story starts and ends with Maloney. <laughs> I, I, I could probably get us like 10 to 20 sponsors of Maloney businesses <laughs> that would leave us exactly <laughs> where we're at right now. Car detailing, <laughs> pizza sauces, duct cleaning. Radon. I actually had a friend who reached out to me because he's now a legitimate duct cleaning guy. I was Where's like, are you trying Don? to fucking scam me? He just uses Don? I... Fuck. <laughs> I'm here all day <laughs> for a couple hours. <laughs> so for today's episode, we wanted to do uh, kind of just some of the craziest Bigfoot encounters and scariest Sasquatch stories we had. We wanted to do kind of a uh, Halloween special for all of you folks. And after looking into some of these stories, I am a Bigfoot agnostic. I don't know about the rest of you guys. It's one of those things where I want to believe, but I still can't quite get over that threshold. But some of these stories are just unexplainable otherwise. Agreed. I mean, there's a lot out there in the, in the wilderness that we don't know about. Um, there's constantly situations of people going missing. Yeah. Um, it's just, I think there's like 400 reported sightings a year of Bigfoot or large animal-human hybrids. Yeah. Um... I mean, one of the largest podcast platforms in the world brings it up constantly, and it's Joe Rogan constantly talking about Bigfoot. Constantly. Like, well, Les Stroud, one of our favorite outdoor enthusiasts, he was, for anyone that's not familiar with Les Stroud, he was one of the guy, well, the guy that ran the whole show Survivor Man, which was one of the most legit early survival shows. Like, the show Survivor, they're not really surviving. Survivor Man, they would just drop Les Stroud in the middle of the forest with like a hundred pounds of camera gear and a lighter. And a knife. And a knife. Film all his own stuff, that's for sure. And so like we're talking one of the most legit TV survival presenters of all time. And that guy believes. He's a firm, on the record, repeated believer. He says he's seen things. He says he's heard things. Even if I have trouble believing it, I'm very much a fan and believer in Les Stroud. So I'm like, okay. He wouldn't just do that for clout. He didn't need any extra exposure. He was already very well respected in his community. And then he took a big leap and he's like, hey, by the way, guys, just so you know, Bigfoot is real. So oh, yeah. I hear stories like that and I hear some of the stories that we're going to talk about today. And it really makes me think like maybe I just haven't been deep enough in the woods or maybe whatever creature is possibly out there just is really good at avoiding humans. Part of my concerns about the believing in Bigfoot is the fact that with the amount of trail cameras out there, with the amount of hunters, with the way technology is just rapidly expanding and like cell phone coverage is growing so quickly. Everybody has satellite reception now. I don't know if you guys heard the recent iPhone update. You can now just 
has satellite connection almost anywhere. Oh, that's cool. It was like the iOS 18 update, I think. So that is a bit of a threat to Garmin as a company with all their satellite devices. But you hear about things like that. We're an increasingly connected society and everybody has high quality cameras in their pockets. And we still haven't had anything as compelling as the Patterson Gimlin film. Oh, from yeah. like, what is that now? 50 years ago? Something yeah. like that. So, but yeah, we're just going to jump right into it. One of the stories that um, Dan actually brought up was Albert Ostman. Uh, do you want to tell us about what happened with Albert Ostman? I, I do, but first I want to like touch on like you're saying, just the possibility of something being out there. And it reminds me a lot, like you bring up the 60s, it reminds me a lot of like, old school serial killers and you go to different counties like say the zodiac killer he killed in different counties and what those officers did was they kept their evidence so close like they didn't share evidence yeah. and that's what i feel like happens a lot with bigfoot like if you were to say go film something we've talked about it behind closed doors like you're almost afraid to present it yes. because a you'll be made fun of nobody's gonna believe you and technology now these days, well, you just go on Facebook, you go through the reels, like you see all these sea monsters getting pulled yeah. out of the water now and, yeah. and, and things like that. Oh, there's so. tons of Bigfoot footage out there. It's, oh, yeah. It's all discredited. Yeah. Even on Alberta alone, there's tons of Nordic footage of guys who spend a lot of time out there and there's all these faces of... So finding what's actually real, if there's anything real out there, opposed to what people are trying to push as real. Yeah. And, and the problem with that is, again, you have 400 sightings in a year. All it takes is one of them being real. Yeah. And it's real. Like yeah. that, that's, that's, you know, there's no there's no disputing that. That's all it takes. But, yeah, if you want to get into Osman, a uh, Canadian prospector who allegedly was held captive for six days in a cave. This happened back in 1924. And I believe he didn't come out with his story publicly till like, 1966 or something like that. And that, like, again, I, I don't know anyone that was born in the 1920s, uh, or, hmm, maybe my grandpa, but, like, we're going way, way back, no, no, grandpa, no, no, maybe late 1920s, but, like, I feel like the culture back then would have been a lot more conservative if you were... You're settling it, the West. You're, yeah. Yeah. Fur trading is still a big prominent thing. If you're, you, if you like were to this even guy, you're just camping that. in the middle of nowhere, yeah. right? Like, you're just... You're up and, and, and wherever you want to go. Everyone's pretty much a prospector. Yeah. 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 Like for us, we would risk ridicule. But I feel like back then, if you were to say some crazy shit, you would actually be socially ostracized. You'd have like, a lobotomy. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's true, though. Like, you, you think about stuff like that. You, you come back and it's crazy. Like, people say, like, the technology we have these days. They're like, I'm just surprised nobody has caught it. But... Even diving into the story, like, it was normal to camp by yourself and be out in the middle of the woods. You're tracking animals. You're, yeah. you know, you're going to different posts. You're making trades. Nowadays, we're in a city. We're going home. We're going to work. Not a lot of people are out there. And the people who are out there, unfortunately, are guys like Todd Sit the Fuck Down Standing, who releases the stuff he releases. So, it, it, that, And that's where you get made fun of for, for stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, you can compare it to the hoaxers. Yeah, no, 100%. And then, you know, uh, a thing I want to touch on too, like we're talking, a guy like, I, I know I make fun of him, but a guy like Dean Kane, who did that $10 million Bigfoot bounty, mm -hmm. he had no experience at all with Bigfoot, didn't believe in it, and he left that show being like, there's something out there. Especially because they took it pretty seriously. Like, they went out in the middle of nowhere. The way they shot it was really hokey. But yeah. they did go out to actual hotspot areas and stuff like that. But they did dumb stuff like, hey, whoever catches the most mosquitoes in the next hour gets a FLIR camera. Okay, I haven't actually like watched night the show. Vision. Did that so actually happen? It 100% happened. Oh. So, so they had to make it a game show. Yeah. Whereas, like, if they were just out there with a group of, say, 12 people and they gave everyone top-line, like, equipment right away, they probably would have found something, like, a lot more, a lot more plausible, a lot more concrete. So, Getting back into the story, like, would you mind breaking down what happened to him? So, uh, Albert yeah. Albert Osman. Yeah. yeah, so Albert Osman, back in 1924, he was hiking, he was camping, he was uh, 
Trappy, and he he tells a story about himself. Uh, he he heard things around his camp um, throughout the night. He described it as not being intimidating, but also not wanting to leave. So he ends up making a fire. He ends up going to sleep, and what happens is. He gets woken up to himself, kind of like Crystal Lake inside the the sleeping bag, and he's getting dragged for what he said is up to three to four hours where Jeez. he is basically brought to a cave where there's a family of Bigfoot, he alleges. Two kids, two adults. Uh, he survived, apparently. They fed him sweet tasting grass they said so maybe that's where he gets the story from if he's eating that sweet yeah. grass but um eventually he he had enough he knew that he kind of needed to escape so when the the bigger of the sasquatch we'll just say it's the male goes mm-hmm. out to go hunting he takes out chewing tobacco which is known as snuff and he starts eating some and the bigfoot gets curious he happens to give the bigfoot some uh, the Bigfoot takes a big dab, you know, probably a rookie when it comes to chewing tobacco, uh-huh. and goes right into a sneezing fit. And that's where Osman took uh, his opportunity, and he ran out of there not looking back. And as we touched on earlier, he didn't tell, he didn't talk about the story for 24 years. So, yeah, so that right, so that would still be yeah, 1948. Then he would have said that and. Now, are, is, do you think he's referring to chewing tobacco, or do you think he's actually referring to snuff where he started? I think he, he meant chewing tobacco, but there's also some claims where uh, the chewing tobacco was replaced by coffee. Because at the back of then, snuff was a big thing where it was like a, a tin, but instead of chewing tobacco, you snorted it. Oh, okay. And it was an instant high, same kind of flavored what have you. But snuff was a huge thing back then where you just sniffed it. I wonder if Bigfoot so would even probably like, know did. Snorted. Well, well, that's the thing, The right? thing, if he's watching this guy do it, and then he tries it himself, that would immediately... Think as a predator. Like when you give something to a dog. What happens when he has something that he doesn't like? He starts freaking out. Yeah. He's constantly blowing sneezing. his nose. Sneezing. And that would be a great way for him to get away, because who are they going to send out after him is the alpha, so the male. Yeah. So if he gets away, the big thing for most predators in the bush is their sense of smell. So that's compromised. His best way of escape would be just keep running because oh, at that yeah. point. And like I've, I've never done snuff or chewing tobacco, but like nicotine gives you like a bit of a high, right? Oh yeah. And if you've never done chew or if you've never done snuff before, like some people do chew, they get hiccups immediately. Uh, they get dizzy. They get lightheaded. It's and like that, a strong stimulant. Well, it's very yeah. And and things like too, right? Like if it's a taste you don't like. One of the main, you know, mechanisms that the body does is your eyes are going to start watering. Yeah, your mouth starts watering, so you dry heave. There you go, you get out of there, man. That thing. <laughs> so snuff would be the same thing, but times ten because like your your uh, uh, sensory canal for smell would be gone completely. Sure. You're dealing with that. You're overwhelmed. Same idea as pepper spray. Like you're exactly. overwhelmed and confused. So this guy, 1948 finally admits that so now he's dealing with the world war ii generation everybody coming back from war and, and this guy's saying i saw a giant ape in the woods that kidnapped me yeah that. that's one way to duck the draft isn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've got i've got ptsd before we even learned that diagnosis he's american right living in bc yeah but that's interesting that's the scary thing when you think about it because like it either happened or it didn't. And yeah. that's why these stories intrigue me so much. Because, you know, how do you, you know, you just imagine you're getting dragged in a sleeping bag for three or four hours. You wake up in a cave and, you know, you're, you're, you got your snuff with you. So I don't know what he had. Maybe he was one of those guys who slept with his bag in his sleeping bag. And by bag, I mean he's got his items for survival. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he had a gun on him. But again, like you think back then, I don't know if I'm using my little rabbit gun or for some of those varmint out there. Like I'm not shooting at a Bigfoot with my 22. No. That would just no, piss it no. off, I think. So, because... Another thing that happened, um, the skeptics took issue with the story because there was, there were like limited food resources in the area because this happened at Toba Inlet, British Columbia. So right on the ocean, kind of a rocky, beachy area. Some people are saying, oh, well, what would 
a family of large primates eat in the area. Okay, I got an idea right there not to cut you off, but what about the tide? Like, well, I was, was going to yeah. say, like, I have issue with the skeptics because, yeah. like, have you ever seen, you know, well, Kodiak bears? Yeah. They're living right on the coast. So, like, during the salmon run, dead fish get washed up, other dead animals get washed up, you have the tidal pools. Well, and things are bigger, too, which does, you know, for people to say that, oh, it doesn't make sense, but, like, isn't it, like, the closer you get to the coastline with, within the forest regions of there, aren't, like, the Kodiaks bigger? Like, Kodiaks yep. are the biggest bear. Kodiaks are the biggest you know, species you... of browns. You have the giant coast redwoods, like... Kodiaks are only on one island, though. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. They but do not leave that island. But the, grizzlies up north, they get large. Ten foot is average. Okay. Yeah, there are other... I know there are other large subspecies of brown bear that live on coastal islands, too. Like, there's 100%. a... There's a Russian brown bear. I forget the name, but it's also in one of the islands up in that area. And Same like, idea. Their main source of food is elk and uh, moose. So exactly. And yeah. that's a thing, too, Rainy. that I, I want to touch on. You know, nobody knows, but we kind of mentioned it last time. There you go. Just throw Sponsor it us. Guinness, man. We're, we're going to <laughs> Ireland here. I love it. Uh, but one thing I did want to touch on, like... Is Bigfoot possibly one of those, like, uh, you, like the Tasmanian devil? How the Tasmanian devil has that, like, lining in its stomach so it can eat, like, rotten meat and stuff like that. Do you think Bigfoot, if he comes across a deer that, like, roadkill, right? Like, yeah. he's just grabbing it. You have so many stories of that. Or they're in the dump, eating at the dump. Like, yeah. I'm wondering, like, what kind of weird stomachs do they have and how have they not had to have their appendixes removed? <laughs> <laughs> I assume they're very similar to us for digestive yeah. reasons. Like, if you look at, like, I think it was in the 70s, a bunch of chimpanzees broke loose in Florida. Oh, man. And they they killed, like, their few people, and they got away, and they're living in the, the Everglades. Or, I don't think any of them are currently alive, at least they don't not suspect to be alive, but there was over a dozen. And I know one that was killed, like, a week later, he had a lot of human food inside of the system. I'm here to say right now on episode two, I still do not fuck with chimpanzees. No, I don't trust them. They'll tear you apart. Yeah. Do not trust them. Like, everything you do, everything's got to be equal. You change up one thing. Like, it's like dealing with an autistic kid, which we're used to with Garrett. (laughs) Fuck. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. I I know know there are certain... God damn it. I know there are certain animals that, like, have ridiculously powerful stomachs and immune systems. Yeah. Like, you look at... A deer that will just go and drink from some dirty puddle of water, and that's enough water for the day. And if we drank from that, we would be quite literally shitting until we're in danger of dying. IBS. Yep. <laughs> um, have you ever seen those like vultures that can just swallow entire bones and digest them? Oh yeah. yeah. Or, I mean, there's goats like uh, some of the like I follow a lot of YouTube channels that involve alpine hunting. One guy he does a lot of elk hunting, and he's got a flock of goats. I think he's got eight goats that he goes with him everywhere. And he goes, yeah, those animals, they don't need to give them water. They get their new, their moisture and the hydration from the plants that they eat. Oh, yeah. I've, seen, I've even seen, um, I forget the species, but yeah, there are goats that they'll just release in the desert and they'll, they'll eat they'll thrive. everything. They'll thrive. Cacti, the yeah. thorns don't bother them. They just nope. eat they'll it all. So. so, yeah, like go, going back, the, uh, the skeptics saying that there there wasn't really anything around for these guys to eat. Like, yeah, the tide pools, right? Like. You, you got a thing. There's always food around. Yeah. Kelp. Always. Shellfish, crabs. Yeah, berries. So, no, I... Yeah. Grasses, I, bark, you name it. Yeah, I totally disagree with Exactly. You know, you get into the bark, there's grubs. There's, there's all sorts of things where if you're not a human and you're just... Well, even if you are a human, you hear all these crazy stories of survival with the things that people eat to stay alive, like... That's everyday life for Bigfoot. So I'm, I'm skeptical of the skeptics. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I totally am. Because those same people are just like us, right? Like, we're on the opposite end. Like, we truly want this thing to be real. But yeah. they're just saying it's not real. Oh, it's a guy in a monkey suit. But there's nothing. There's they, They're they not coming with anything yeah. other than the exact same thing we're coming with, which is an opinion. Yeah, we yeah. don't know for sure one way. They don't know for sure one way. The only people that know are, A, the people that were actually there. And B, the people that have much more advanced degrees than we have. And like, yeah. I, I would take a primatologist opinion over a skeptic's opinion. Oh man, I hear you. That's uh, Jane Goodall. Let's go. Doesn't, well, doesn't she believe? She says it's very possible. And then, of course, we got Jeff Meldrum's book, um, Let Legend Meets Science. That's another great read. If you want to get into that, guys, well, pick she, it up on Amazon. It's a good oh, book. I also got you this, Gareth. I forgot since you hooked me up with that sweet bag. The oh, other day. dude. Dude, thank you. Yeah, that's wicked. Yeah. Got ourselves a Sasquatch patch. 
so we're good to go. I mean, it's not like it's a three and a half foot tall ceramic Sasquatch that is framed. I know. It's oh, really good. I showed you that. this one. Yeah, as well, no, right? that's cool. There you go. Bring that into the woods, man. Next next time we record, I should bring the uh, Sasquatch statue. Just hold it up. Every time you're scared, just be like, "Yeah, no, I'm one of you." <laughs> that would actually be incredible. That's definitely Dude, something that needs to happen. Have like a Please. Sasquatch totem. Please. Uh, we got another story here from Portlock, Alaska. Um, if I have any listeners from Alaska, please reach out because I am wanting to go back up to Alaska and do a trip all along the Panhandle. So please reach out if you're watching. Now, um, now Alaska, that's is that like number one hotspot you think in in the U.S. I feel like, like it's for the Pacific, big guys, I like feel they're like huge. It's Pacific Northwest is like where the majority of the uh, yeah. sightings are. So like. Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and like kind of BC, Alberta, that whole chunk. I will actually have to post it in the show notes, but uh, many years back I found there was an Alberta Bigfoot sightings map that I saved to my Google Drive. And if you look at it, incredible. The majority of the sightings are centered right along the edge of the foothills. So, from anyone outside of Alberta, just look it up. But the town of Hinton. All the way down the edge of the mountains, down to Okotoks, almost down to the very border. There are just so many different sightings. Um, and they were split up in a couple different ways. I am now forgetting what the different color codes meant. But, but I mean, even if you go across the mountainside to get like the Portland area, they have tons of sightings in Portland. I Yeah, I believe the blue ones are actual physical... Sightings. The red ones, I believe, are sounds. Okay, so the blue ones are like tracks and stuff like that. Okay, so that's tracks found. The yellow stars on the map. I will link this in the show notes for anyone that's wondering what's happening. Um, so the yellow one, that's on the Beefro website, a Bigfoot field research organization. Man disturbs two sleeping creatures. And let's see what the red is. And you know, I, I just looked into sounds. it too. Sounds. <laughs> They actually have an Alberta Bigfoot group that gets together every once in a while, and we just missed it. They had a conference uh, in September. Are you serious? Yeah, they did. Shit. So I was looking into it, like, oh, do we go there and uh, just to listen to some of the stories, right? I'm pretty sure I've looked into that group as well, and one of the guys is one of the main ones I'm referring to that has like fake footage. Oh, okay. Of Bigfoots. Yeah. So the the purple stars on the map are things. So there's any kind of like video or film evidence. Okay. So yeah, anyone that's listening, check the show notes after I'll add the uh, map. And you know, getting back into Alaska, that's where Les Strung found... Uh, God, I'm going to murder you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where he had one of his main encounters, actually. He talks about... on the, I'm, I'm sorry, Les, I'm just having fun. <laughs> we love you. Um, but that's where he talks about one of his main encounters when he was actually chopping wood while the camera was off. And then a big tree broke and he heard like a whoop. So that he was like, wow, that was one of his main stories. So Alaska is definitely a hot spot for sure. A lot of untamed wilderness out there. It's very sparsely populated too. Like as far as the states go, it's the least sparsely populated. It's just so much territory. The majority of stuff that goes up on up there is like resource extraction industry. Yeah. So oil and gas, bit of logging, bit of fishing. Um, and people who want to avoid public. They don't want to be involved with... Yeah. regular society yeah. yeah they live on their land they their 90 percent of their job is making sure their land is set up for them year-round and bar like they still barter out there too like a lot of trading and, and things like that yeah so, they trade labor yeah. a lot in that yeah. area the guy that has the bobcat usually has everyone else in the neighborhood doing stuff on his property yeah so they can have access to that bobcat mm -hmm. that kind of mentality so very communal very communal you know your neighbors and that actually does kind of tie into this. So Port Lock, which used to be known as Port Chatham, that's an abandoned town on the Alaska coast. It was allegedly abandoned due to Bigfoot attacks. I don't know oh. if you wanted to jump in on this one, Wayne. Yeah, I mean, there was a whole bunch of uh, murders, you would say, of people either just going flat out missing in the community or they'd be found in the same lagoon or waterway with uh, not animal attacks, but either beaten to death or one miner was believed to be crushed by a generator that was over 800 pounds. Jeez. Wow. So somebody had picked up that generators and beat this man to death with it. Fuck. Um, That's a bad way to go. But within within a few years of the, them getting their post post office, 
um, to being a full-fledged town, because the whole town was supposed to be a canning town. Um, canning, they had like for fish? Fish. Like, they were supposed to be one of the big exports of fish in the area. Um, a lot of money was put into this this area, but with so many disappearing disappearances and so many unexplained deaths of people dying in mysterious ways well, that they shut down the whole town. Yeah. And one of the last guys that was left in the town was the postmaster because he couldn't leave until they shut down the post office. Mm-hmm. He said he was living in an abandoned town and he would constantly see large males in the wood lines. When there's the only way in to get into Port Lock is he by boat or by plane, and it's a float plane. There's no airport, everything's rural. And even recently, some of the locals well, they made a TV show about it where these locals were going to come and like try and see if the town's viable, if they can mm-hmm. rebuild it, and look into these allegations. And constantly, all the footage uh, of people were getting sick on the, on the, the, um, uh, documentary team, I guess you would call them. They would come there and they're filming all these things, looking into these Bigfoot sightings, looking into these common areas and talking about it. But the entire time they were there, people were getting sick. Um, their electronic equipment was failing. Generally, the two things were, were related to that they believe was an EMP field. Yeah. So there's an elect- electromagnetic field in the area that's causing these people to get sick. Yeah. But even the footage they do have, there's videos of guys sitting in a, a tree blind overnight. And he could hear things below him. And they, he's terrified. And you could hear in the footage, the birds stop. All the wildlife stops in the area. It is dead quiet. All, quiet. all you hear is him freaking out about something below him. And then he needs to get out of there. And then one of the other footage that I've seen is they found a buoy to tie off boats to shore. They found it on the beach. They brought it up to camp. And the next morning, they found it in a tree over 60 feet in the air. <laughs> Wow. I mean, it could be just staged for History Channel's, pretty sure it was History Channel's Portlock Mysteries or something like that. Okay. But yeah, they found this, this buoy that's over 30 pounds. It's designed to be in the ocean to keep boats in place and stand out with over 10-foot waves. It was found up a tree. And from what I saw, all of the guys involved were kind of shaken up by it. But I mean, it's History Channel. It's... It could be all bullshit. Yeah, they, they kind of lost their credibility well, with what, some of the shows. When, when do animals and predators, like, when they really go all out and, and attack and they become defensive, is, like, maybe this town was super close to its actual territory. I mean, right? it was a, it's a fishing hub. There's yeah. a reason why it's a fishing hub, is so, that's the main source of uh, protein for this animal in yeah. that area. And mm-hmm. we're obstructing it or, or keeping it from completing its duties. Duties, like it's a some sort of member of society. <laughs> you don't pay but no, taxes. You're, you're exactly right. Like yeah, yeah like dude, you say duties, say it, it, it's daily routine. But you're exactly right. Like when it comes down to it, like basic animals, they they do three things, right? They eat to survive. They mate to keep their species going. And then, depending on how they are, like certain animals, right? They're very protective over their very young territorial. and stuff like that. Yeah. So very territorial. You, you go into a grizzly bear across the, you know, the way you're looking at it, it's fine. You take 20, 30 steps towards it and there's cubs. Like, you're you're, a threat. you're gone, man. Yeah. So, there's, there's always that even like rattlesnakes, anything. Like, the first time you see something, it's always going to try and scatter away. But if you're building and you're building and you keep building and you're taking the logs from their territory, you know, fear is no longer exa- exa- Exactly. You're defensive, you're not territorial at that point. You're and, trying to get your land back. And touching on people being sick, like filming that show, like um, stress and fear is a big factor when yep. it comes to getting sick. So if they're thinking stuff like that, your mind starts playing tricks on you. But you bring up the EMP, and like I don't want to get into like the interdimensional sort of thing. I know that's crazy, it's a theory, but you got to think, a right? right now. Exactly. And if people are feeling that, and if they're using readings, and they're getting those sort of like the data back that supports it, you yeah. got to kind of at least glance at it. Just like Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah. Oh, uh, we'll uh, talk Skinwalker uh, Ranch <laughs> another time. I've, that I've stuff le- I've is learned, crazy. I've learned that nature is crazy enough that I shouldn't just discount things. Like, I don't know if I've ever told you about those salamanders that can have anywhere from one to five sets of DNA. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Because like, for humans, we have, like, the two sets of genes from our two parents. 
for this, there are these three species of salamander. It's the Jefferson salamander, the blue spotted salamander, and Moving I forget the up. third type. But like these ones, they can <laughs> they can either reproduce asexually and have one set of genes, or up to five sets of genes. There's that a few is frogs. Crazy. There's a few frogs that do that as well. So I hear things like that. I hear about like you know fleas where they have like these hip joints that can just function in a way that should be mechanically almost impossible. I there are so many outliers in nature that thinking that there's an ape that might have abilities we're not aware of yet. I'm like, okay. Well, for I'm still a little skeptical, but I'm not going to outright deny it. For how many decades we were in Africa before we believed the locals about gorillas, like mountain yeah. gorillas. Like they they said there was hairy men with big teeth that live in the in the forest. Yeah. We didn't know we were in there for 30 years before we even came across a gorilla. Europeans didn't see Great a point. panda until panda what, the 1900s. I was yeah. just going to say, when they came back, oh, there's a giant black and white panda, or gi- giant black and white bear, sorry, pardon me, that eats trees. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, but of course, nobody's going to believe that. They're some of the dumbest creatures, and it took the same thing, like 20, 30 years for them to physically get it on film. And these things are borderline short bus yeah <laughs> if it wasn't for human intervention i don't know if we would still have them uh, and yet people are still getting killed by panda bears i can't believe even it. recently a, a japanese uh, uh i wouldn't say she was a zoologist but she a zoo caretaker she was mauled by a polar uh, panda oh, bear man. what a way to go you know what yeah. screw the chimpanzees but bring me a red panda I love those guys. They okay, they're, they're, they're cute. cute. They're cute. Hey, That's in the same realm as a koala bear. Yeah, hey, they can be vicious, but I mean, that's too adorable to count. <laughs> they're just and awesome. Fun fact: ninety percent of the T Rex noises in Jurassic Park came from a koala bear. That's great. <laughs> okay, speak segue real quick. Okay, okay. Did you hear the theory that the T Rex legitimately had wings? Yeah, uh, like as much as a chicken. I don't. Yeah, mm. because of like. When you look at an ostrich and then you look at a T Rex, right? It's got those little. When you look at the skeletons, yeah, you the look skeletons at the skeletons are dead giveaway. Okay, so, like like vestigial wings. Yeah, like, they don't like really it didn't function, fly, but, but he okay. had the old, you know, what have you done for me lately? Chicken <laughs> dance. The water wings. Same with so. raptors. Raptors are in the same ballpark. So that's um, kind of cool. If you look at velociraptors or other raptors um, throughout history, they did the. I think there was a movie. It was like a thousand BC or something like that. And oh, uh, uh, apparently uh, most people say that is the most accurate depiction of a, of a raptor. Was, was it that action movie 10,000 BC where the guy yeah, like, yeah, rides yeah, yeah, a yeah. mammoth and everything? Yeah. And so I remember seeing that. They're going through a bamboo that. forest and there's these giant eight foot tall, basically ostriches that are man eating. They've got that big man, that big, big toe like a velociraptor. So this is nuts. Like they, people started like living in that area as early as the 1700s. Yeah, and it, it was in the 1900s, like 1940s, I believe. Yeah, 1940s, and it says they were all gone by 1949. Yeah, because, like, miners and guys in the area were beaten to death with commercial mining equipment, like generators. And that would generate a lot of interest. Well, and if you look at, like, one of the guys was beaten to death, like, there's there's no case in, like, animal predation or anything where animals beat someone to death Without biting them, without yeah. any sort of yeah. death struggle. Yeah. But Claw mark. There's more than once, evidence. There was even a guy in Portlock who said he had somebody, he thought someone jumped on his back and started beating him to death. His dog was able to fend them off, but that guy was later later died from his injuries. But he described it as a six foot tall hairy man that ran into the woods. That's crazy. The weird part is, though, even with all of that, only one of the deaths made it into the newspaper. So it seems like a lot of this was oral tradition that was passed down but the newspapers weren't really covering the mysterious they wouldn't deaths up why would yeah, they and if it happens, it's an up and coming town they don't want people exactly. to not exactly in 49 right like there's a lot bigger problems going on in the world 100%. Rather, yeah. rather than hey let's throw this in there and you have to remember where they are it's Portlock, Alaska it's a northern remote community in Alaska they yeah. have a post office that's their big claim to fame yeah so like back then news isn't moving very quickly no not at all but when you have enough people dying in your community that you evacuate for unknown reasons. Like, it's not like, oh, these people died from scurvy. It's not, oh, these people died from a serial killer. It was like, these people have been beaten to death. We have no idea how or why. We should probably leave. We're not welcome here. <laughs> well, and when the things that they're killed by are physically impossible to lift without 
you know, so what, there's a group of 12 guys going around yeah. butchering people, and that just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Hey, no. hey, hey, you, you, you lay down right there, okay, we're going to yeah. drop this generator on you. Yeah, like that's... He was, like, multiple struck, like someone picked it up like it was a box and beat this guy to death with a generator. Yeah. Which and is physically unlikely for any human that I've ever come in contact with. I don't think a gorilla could do that. Well, oh, you hear yeah. the stories, right, of Bigfoot... Throwing sticks, throwing stones, throwing whatever it could get its its hands on, yeah. and you got to think too. It makes sense because other uh, monkeys, apes, they have to like they can't throw overhand, so it makes sense, right? Like you're just pushing or pulling a big. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> the more you think I, about that, man, I don't know if I want to go here, guys. Man, I, and the thing is, I'd go there immediately. Yeah, well, I, would go, I would go there. I'd go together. Yeah. I would happily go there solo. I wouldn't be on the ground in a tent, mind you. I'd have some don't, sort don't of go solo. Line. Don't go solo. Well, we I'd need... happily go solo. Uh, and by happily. forty-nine too, right? Like a lot of the building codes and stuff like that. Like, sure, they're they're not up to what we are now, but. It was a full town. You would be able if you like if you did have money. Like I think it'd be plausible to renovate a town like this. It was a full town. That's there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was like you look at the pictures back then. It was a full town. Granted, the pictures nowadays, yeah. nature is like oh, ninety-eight it's taken back. Yeah. percent taken back. Yeah. But property. that would almost work in your favor too, right? Like if nobody's there, you go there, and if these creatures now are using the the town, Bigfoot, not creatures, are like using the town as as cover. Who knows? You hear about that too. Like a lot of these, well, they use lines as an ex- as an example, right? Like when one isn't fully in the pride and it gets kicked out, mm-hmm. like you maybe like Bigfoot could be the same, right? Where there's one that kind of gets like shoved to the male, side, yeah. Kind of fine as well like, hey, yo, yeah. you need you need to go. So what's easier than going to a town where nobody's at? And same thing, like raccoons, right? Like different animals. Once you're used to things, and that's why you uh, see the things in the dump. But being devil's advocate, when it comes to that, even recently, like I said, there was a a bunch of local native tribe that was trying to retake the land and see if it was viable. They made a TV show about it. If there was a juvenile Sasquatch was trying to mark his turf, catch it. There'd be, like, I mean, they have drones, they have yeah. infrared cameras. Yeah. He stood out to all of that. But that being said, a lot of their infrared cameras, be it hoaxy TV shit or real life stuff, they can't, cameras constantly fail. No. Their yeah. batteries would fail. Well, I know Bobo. And that's where the EMP thing comes the, in. The classic TV. Oh, oh yeah. Finding yeah. Bigfoot there, Bobo. Has a has a great story where he says he has this awesome FLIR camera. He's like, you know, I'm out in Mount Mount St. Helens and I'm filming this thing, brother. And, and like it craps 12, out. Twelve minutes. I didn't hit record. And I'm like, dude. And you know, I'm trying to go back now to prove it's a thing. Like, no, if you, you can't, yeah, no, you just can't. Like, don't even tell <laughs> that story. Especially <laughs> in this day and age, as yeah, you're, you're doing pics or it didn't happen. Period. Exactly. The, the and word, nothing's from behind. behind. Well, like, I'm mocking it so hard, but now it'll happen to me one day. Yeah. I'm going to be out in the woods, and suddenly I'm going to have three seconds of battery. I've been life fishing left. with you. I've seen you. Know, you're on a GoPro. So oh, like, God oh, damn it. And, and you know, it's like, going to happen. <laughs> driving home from, from Dunster Delight, when, when I'm driving home with uh, Steph and my buddy Jeremy, and uh, a bear literally ran across the road, grabbed a de- like roadkill, and then carried it off. That was probably like... 10, 15 seconds. By the time I got my phone out to record that thing, I had push line. Yeah. Yeah. So it happens fast. Yep. Like you almost need the technology. Like Elon, get us some contacts <laughs> where we can just, you're, it's physically on our glasses like the whole time. Like, like a GoPro. We got them already. Yeah. Glasses like, are that, a thing. That's what we need. Something like that. And it's got to have the night vision capability. And unfortunately, if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you capture a giant red image, again, people are always going to have something to say. At this point, yeah. it's body or nothing. Exactly. Like, you got to put them down, which yeah. you're going to be hated for. But... Oh, yeah. You'll be hated and, and loved at the same time. Like you, you, you proved the Bigfoot, but you also murdered an endangered species. Yeah. But is it endangered? We won't know. <laughs> I'm going to pee. Uh, keep feeling. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Seal. Wayne oh, Furby is on awesome. it. <laughs> two coffees, two beers. <laughs> two coffees, two beers. Get it in the Guinness Book of <laughs> World Records. Uh, we're going to jump on to one that I'm sure anyone that's listening that knows Bigfoot is familiar with. Huge story. The Mount St. Helens Bigfoot disaster. So the volcano is located in southwest Washington state. Um, 
I'm sure anyone that's grown up in North America is familiar with Mount St. Helens, but for anyone that isn't, it was probably the biggest volcanic eruption in living memory. Um, but definitely in North America, for sure. For sure. Uh, the story began May 18th, 1980. Day when... before my birthday. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, 1980? I was 87. Oh, okay, I was like, I was like holy <laughs> shit. Like, Dan, Dan, you I didn't even get your shit together. God damn. damn. Um, yeah, one of the most beautiful volcanoes in the Cascade Range erupted. A thick cloud of ash, rock, and smoke smothered the nearby forests and rivers. Thousands of animals were forced to flee the eruption. And some people believe that amongst those animals were the Bigfoot. So the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the National Guard were called in to... Oh. It appears the camera may have stopped recording. Well, that's okay. We're going to hit the old record button again and, well, and, and, and get it going. If it's not recording, wait, I want to heat up more food. Oh, okay. All right, she we're going to... Oh, we just keep the audio going. We'll keep the audio Honestly, more I keep it going because that's all filler, right? Oh, this yeah. This is filler. I have to pee, too, now. Good. I made sure to just pee on the floor, so... Just, 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 thank you, thank you. Just clean. Just, just kidding. Just a little bit. <laughs> just grab it with a sock. <laughs> If anybody wants to dive into Mount St. Helens while I'm gone, actually, no, yeah, we yeah. wait for you. It's yeah. your show, man. The Mount St. Helens stuff is like actually ridiculous. Like, I mean, literally, my stories tie into Mount St. Helens. Yeah, well, you want to talk? Well, that I'll recording was Mount St. Helens. Yeah, I know. Uh, Gareth, yeah, Gareth was telling me that you have quite a few different audio recordings. He told me like, when was that? Like a year, year and a half ago. Like where you yeah. you had like North. a big experience yeah up at your camp right Fort St John South of Pink Mountain Northern BC that's crazy I tried literally I like it's a big bear proof yeah dumpster outside yeah I took garbage out from the kitchen and before I could take two steps I got a whooping response and I immediately went to the 1970s recordings of a Bigfoot and then I sat there and I put my phone on record for like. 20 minutes, I didn't get a response. Murphy's Law, man. <laughs> so in my mind, like, it heard me open the door, and it heard a whooping sound from, like, that metal-on-metal metal creaking sound when you open the the dumpster door. Mm -hmm. And it just it immediately thought it was another Bigfoot or whatever the hell else that it would call itself. Well, you're, like, more familiar, like, you and Gareth, for sure, like, being outdoorsmen. But, yeah. like, is there... A Anything in Canada that like whoops, like aside from Not maybe at all. A, like an owl, maybe, but Bobcats, it's a completely different sound. Bobcats and cougars make a lot of unique sounds. Yeah. Same with crows and ravens. Yeah. But nothing that I've ever heard like that. I know a lot of times, like, bobcats uh, are almost like they sound like someone in distress. Same with foxes. Yeah. Foxes make some good sounds, but I've never ever heard something whoop like that. And it was like waiting for a whoop back. And the, like, I tried to whoop back, but I cannot cover the distance of this no, thing. No, And it, I probably did hear me, just assume that I was not what it was trying to communicate with. Um, yeah. Well, you got to think, like, the vocal range is completely different, too. Yeah. Like, compared to what we can do and what they can do. Well, it almost sounds like, to me, it would be the equivalent of... Like, someone could sing really well, but you go to karaoke, you try to murder a song, like, do really well, but even, no matter how good you are at impersonating that artist, you're not the legit that artist. artist. No. So, I think that's the same. Like, you gotta think when it comes to Bigfoot and the whoops, right? Well, and just our vocal range. They say that yeah. vocal range is not human compatible. Like, I think the only no... person close would maybe be Axl Rose. <laughs> <laughs> that's about it. Mm -hmm. Alright, I'm back. So, and then the knees! All right. <laughs> <laughs> We're having fun. Uh, all right, so, all right so, so, just so I know, while I was gone, that audio is good, though. We, 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 I haven't played any audio slurs. yet. We didn't knock. Okay. No, no audio. We were just touching base <laughs> on uh, some of the experiences Wayne had up in camp. Nice. So, uh, all hey, right, so. Get back to the eruption, my Mount man. Mount St. Helens. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the National Guard were called in to assist with the evacuation and public safety. While they were cleaning up the af aftermath of the eruption, they allegedly came across the bodies of two Sasquatch. Not all of the Sasquatch around Mount St. Helens were dead, though. An injured Sasquatch was observed by military personnel moving through the forest, which led them to a large group of Sasquatch which had been burned by the hot ash uh, from the volcano. These Sasquatch were allegedly provided medical aid by the military on scene. Hard evidence proving this encounter is hard to find, so this mostly lives on just as a unique story. 
And according to the USGS, the United States Geological Service, this area is now referred to as the Sasquatch Steps. Ooh. Now, I... Uh, this is another one of those ones where I want to believe it so bad. Like, because there is enough plausible deniability, like, does the U.S. military hide stuff? All the time. Would they hide something like this? Of course they would. Yeah. But I've... I- my personal opinion on it is I think with the amount of whistleblowers and stuff we have now, we would have heard more about it. Yeah. Because we are getting all the UFO disclosure now. Well, yeah, get, there's you, footage you of it all the time. You get a Snowden for sure. Yeah. Like 100%. The and fact, that's the, the problem fact that, like, too. Like a Bob Lazar, right, comes yeah. out with all that UFO stuff and he's so discredited. But, like, we literally have the technology that he talked about now. Like, yeah. just a little fingerprint gets you in your phone. Like, these yeah. are all things he talked about in the 90s. And you got to think, too, like, everything that is being released now, the government's got to be at least 25 to 50 steps ahead. Of I say 10 out. to 15 years. Yeah. And I, they're, I not totally releasing, agree. they're not going to release information to the public that's not relevant anymore. Totally like, agree. If it's relevant to something that they're doing now, they're not going to release it. So if Bigfoot were real, do you feel like we would have, we would have had real high-level leaks by now? I Unless do. there was a reason not to. Unless there was a, a general belief that the public uh, wouldn't benefit from the knowledge. Like, yeah. hiding it from the, the general public is a greater service than allowing everyone to know what's going on. You basically don't want a bunch of hillbillies and rednecks running out there with their grandpa's shotguns well, trying to kill these things, right? I mean, you yeah. look at presidents. All these presidents, especially U.S., for example, U.S., they always have these presidents. They make all these claims that they're going to change all these things. And they get in the office and they get all the actual information of what's going on and why they can't do what they want to do. Yeah. And they just fall back into the regular chain of events. Like Basically figureheads. I, I well, feel, yeah, I feel they, like a lot of people thought Trump was going to be the one to release all the info. Well, and the, even now, like he's had two attempts on his life. Like people are still going to push for it because the reason is because he's not going to stick with the status quo. He is an outlier. I'm not saying he's going to be a great president. I'm not saying he's going to make smart choices. But he's not going to follow the status quo. He yeah. will make can, up can his own decisions. Least, can he at least release the Bigfoot info? Well, my big thing about that, what do you too, think? What do you think all this FBI stuff of stolen footage is? Man, it's, you, well, and you, it's UFOs yeah. or Bigfoot or the Kennedy oh, assassination. Oh, yeah, the Kennedy assassination, too. Like, that's that's another crazy story. But, you know, thinking back, uh, maybe the reason why, like, there hasn't been a body discovered. You talk about those assassination attempts on, on Trump. Like, America doesn't look like they have the best shooting percentage. Well, and then also, <laughs> not including that, but there was, I think, 20 or 30 years in Africa where people were, or Europeans were told, that all these elephants go to the same burial grounds. Yeah. Mm. They and the no one believed it. And then all of a sudden they found it and it was just all of a sudden overnight it went from folklore to scientific fact. And yeah. you know, picking up on that as well, um when they when they talk about Bigfoot and they talk about the possibility of it being alive, especially in, in this context, you also hear and you also see it every day with highly endangered animals. Like, you cannot go into their territory. You can't build. You can't do anything. So if Bigfoot is so real, one of the reasons I've heard that they keep it down is, like, logging and forestry would basically they have to come back. to a halt. Same idea with, um, yeah. like, if you look at Yosemite and the evolving wolf population and the territories that they hold, they're very strict with their territories yeah. around the wolf packs. Yeah. So if they know someone else is in their territory, they might push their territory back if they're not looking for confrontation. And nothing corrects an ecosystem faster than an apex predator. Yeah. yeah. So you go to these places, and if the ecosystem is in check, if everything's good, you don't have, like, say, a lot of sick deer or a lot of other sickly animals chances are you have a, an apex predator there yeah. and you bring that up with the wolves like i know that they released uh like quite a bit of them into, into a certain area i don't have it off the top of my head but um was it the yellowstone video it could be yeah. but like it literally corrected the whole ecosystem like yeah. beavers came back yeah plants came back yep. the, the elk deer stopped went eating down. everything right so, on the riverbank and, yep. and, and and that to me is is a is another reason you go to some of these areas where Say they know there's not the bears and everything, but there's all these other uh, signs that that point to it. And well, shit. Yeah. Even in Northern California, 
Um, like the grizzly population's dismal. Yeah. There's not a lot of grizzlies. The wolf population is just coming back. Mountain lions are still scarce, and yet all these animals are still in check. Well, and you bring up bears too. Like I just found, like just found out. I know. Well, it's been known forever, but um, like mama bears don't really like leaving their cubs, and they're so threatened because or at least they I didn't realize like other bears, like alpha bears, oh, yeah. literally take the eat cubs them. and yeah. you know. So Bigfoot, you're opportunistic, right? Like I'm, I don't want to picture a Bigfoot eating Winnie the Pooh, but <sighs> but if like, you look it, at it, it's all survival Darwinism. If so. you look at chimpanzees or gorillas, if there are other children, that they're eating been, it. They'll they'll kill the child that's that's been fostered by an yeah, animal. which is crazy. If it's not their own it. offspring, they'll kill it. Which is wild. It's yeah. wild when you think about that. But no, you're talking about the Saint Helens thing. There is a story that you and I talked about years ago, where a, a, a physical ambulance apparently put a Bigfoot in the back of it and like treated its wo- treated its wounds. And to me, that story is like, uh, That's you, a you know what I mean? Because yeah. look at all the DNA and everything that would be there as well. Like, there's all that stuff. And why wouldn't you, if if you had this encounter, like, I get you don't want to be made fun of, but if there's all these other witnesses, yeah. you know? I would like, go out of my way on. to get evidence. Yeah, Take man. a hair sample, take a blood sample. I would be dosing that fucker to overdose. And, it does, oh. and again, too, like, it's just weird, right? Like, you hear these black helicopters where Apache helicopters were like, you know, flying these Bigfoot out of the zone. It's just weird that that's the one thing, you know, they do it to. Like, let's get all the Bigfoot out of here. But we're one in. It's just weird. Unless yeah. it's yeah. unless they know for a fact it's from a different dimension or and something. And to not keep Shit one. like that. Like, to me, like, if they believe it's an alien species, like, from a different dimension or not, sure. You Area 51, that shit. Yeah. And then you do your whole... Um, uh, disinformation campaign you make everyone involved seemed like they're kooky yeah like they did in the 50s 40s well some of those area 51 stories where they talk about reverse engineering some of those ufos with a physical alien that talks to yeah. you telepathically that some of the stuff is just so unbelievable well there's that this, it it's almost believable there's yeah. a story of a guy in, from winnipeg i believe he was a silver prospector I want to say it was the 60s or 70s. He took two buses to get to this mountain range. While he was there, um, he witnessed this craft land in front of him. He believed it was some sort of military technology. He's German from descent. Um, He thought it was some sort of military plane. All stainless steel. He saw no rivets, no welds. It was all one seams from what he said. He went to investigate to make sure the pilots were okay. And when they took off, the blast from the, the takeoff burned him oh, over yeah. 90% of his body, and it was all radiation that normally they wouldn't see. That's they had to get wild. special equipment to find out what radiation he had. And the burn marks on his chest matched the grading that he explained on the right. side of the press. Yeah, I right. remember that story now. Now that He had to take two that. buses back to get yeah. to a hospital. And he didn't go to the police. He didn't go to anyone. He made a pamphlet, and he put it on his front porch just so reporters would leave him alone. Yeah, wow, that's shitty. No, and and you know, like again, I'm reading a lot of these dates here, and a lot of them, 1924, like early times, and again, like people talk about all oh, with the technology we have, but our technology is almost so advanced that when you go camping, we're all glampers now, and we don't trust the images we see. Yeah, like you, you have the campers, you have a giant tent that you yeah. can't bring out to the middle of nowhere. Nobody that I know. Just sleeps under the stars. No, nobody I know. I do. Maybe Wayne, does. <laughs> but that like that's that's about it. Like I would never, you know, think okay, I'm just bringing a sleeping bag with me, right? And too many people they they pack really heavy, so yeah. maybe that's a big thing that's that's keeping it uh, from being found. Yeah, and we, honestly, we bring our barriers with us into the woods. Exactly, and also these animals know how to avoid people. Yeah. So if we're out in the woods making a lot of noise, we have a camp set up, they're going to respect our territory that we have currently because yeah. they don't know who we are. 
Um, Even if they do know where we are, they know better than coming close to us. And they can smell us from a distance. I think it's called yeah. Ma- Man Eater. It's a hunting show that's on Netflix. Meat oh, no, Meat Eater. Meat Eater. Great, yeah. great show. Mm-hmm. But there's an episode where they're hunting bears, and this bear is like, dude, it's literally like three football fields away, and you watch this bear like kind of... He smells it. And it, it's gone. He knows her so, there. Like, which is nuts to me, like when you think about something like that. So I, I heard that like a, a black bear's sense of smell is like a thousand times better than a bloodhound. Yeah. Which is insane. Yeah. Why aren't we using them to track people? I'm and sure then, we could breed a pygmy bear. <laughs> like I, I feel like our that science would be is hilarious. Well, and then you get into the grizzly territory. Grizzlies are predominantly in the areas that I frequent are predominantly predators. Mm-hmm. They go for the easy kill. They go for what they can. Calves. And like working up in the Arctic, there's nothing around. So if they smell something a mile, two miles away, they're going to come investigate. Yeah. Especially yeah. in October, November time, like September. It's getting late in the year. They need to get their calories up before they hibernate. Oh, yeah. Can I kill you? Can I eat you? I've literally been on a runway with 150 dudes and had a grizzly that was over 10 feet tall come to say hi. Because he wanted to see what we were. Oh, goodness. There was an F-350 that went between us, and he was hitting him with bear, uh, rubber bullets. He got hit with uh, uh, bear flares, pepper spray. He didn't care. Evolution, yeah. man. We were fo- food, and there was two of them. We only dealt with one of them, and he was the alpha. We assumed the other one was his brother, but like the second the alpha left, the other one left as well. Mm-hmm. But there was 150 adult males sitting on a runway, and he had no qualms. About come to say hi. They, yeah, they, they don't view us the way we view we us. We are food. <laughs> and you know, you can also put this in the video too, uh, Gareth. The, like Mount St. Helens, like a lot of cool things about Washington is Washington, when they printed their encyclopedia of what lived in their forest regions, Bigfoot was on there. What? And yeah. with their, the mountain, the one we're talking about. Yeah. The Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens. And they talk about, like, the reason why they know it. Like, they literally say in their description, like, DNA, hair, uh, scat was, like, found. And th- those things cost money and to even print in, out. Even in the 1800s, like, Ape Canyon is associated with a group of settlers that had a bunch of their livestock killed. And they sent out a bunch of Inuit, or not Inuit, First Nation hunters and local hunters that knew the area to track down the things that were killing their livestock, they all said it was a giant ape person. Jeez. That actually, getting back to Mount St. Helens as well, there was another story we had that took place right in that area, the whole yeah. Ape Canyon story. Yeah. So Ape Canyon is a gorge along the edge of the Plains of Abraham on the southeast shoulder of Mount St. Helens in the U.S. state of Washington. Um, so the name alludes to a legend about a 1924 encounter with eight men, so well before the eruption, uh, which was later incorporated into Bigfoot folklore. Ape Canyon has heavily, it was heavily impacted by the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. Uh, adjacent to that steep canyon is the present Ape Canyon Trail, popular with hikers and mountain bikers. There's another feature called Ape Cave. So what happened was, in the summer of 1924, a group of gold prospectors claimed that seven-foot-tall ape-like animals attacked them with boulders, According to their tale, they came across the animals in the wilderness, and when one of the group fired a rifle at the anim- at one of the animals, he struck it three times and saw the wounded animal topple off a cliff. The eight men supposedly returned later to bombard their cabin with large stones and leave giant footprints. The yeah. story caused a local sensation, prompting U.S. Forest Service rangers J.H. Huffman and William Welch to investigate. Uh, these men descended into the supposedly inaccessible canyon, but found nothing. They then demonstrated how 14... Uh, inch long footprints were found near the cabin that could be easily faked and they concluded that the miners put the large stones by their own cabin uh, this story was debunked even though it has remained popular to this day probably one of the most popular Sasquatch stories out there is the Ape Canyon one yeah. and they and I don't know if I told you guys about the um, audiobook I listened to recently called Devolution by Max Brooks okay I told you if you want to hear it there's this audiobook which it's almost like that exact story if it took place in the modern day. They so, made a fictional story about that whole situation. Oh, yeah. Of like a crazy, um, I wouldn't say I'm, there are a bunch of woke people living in a secluded suburb. Right on. They they wanted to start like a tech utopia in the middle of Tesla the Tesla community. Okay. Like yeah. solar panel shingles. Yeah, everything delivered by then drones. The, then the earthquake or the volcano erupts. 
they're strapped, trapped, and then the, the local Sasquatch start attacking them. Oh, that's wild. For, for that um, book, though, they did Mount Rainier as the volcano. Yeah, yeah. I know you're talking about this story, but Canada's kind of... Ape, well, not Ape Canyon, but uh, for our Monster Quest fans, there's that cabin in Ontario that apparently they get hit a lot. It's been ransacked quite a few times. Yeah, and they got they yeah. got blood samples from there. Yeah, that they They've say unknown samples. DNA, but of course, right? Like, who, hey, could you, you elaborate? Know? I don't. I don't know there's a it's... hunting cabin. It's in like Ontario, so. rural Ontario. It's a flying flame yeah. kind of island thing, and yearly they were being like. They assumed a local was messing with them or somebody like a feral human living on the island was mm-hmm. messing with them. So they started setting traps like two by fours with nails in front of the doors and stuff like that. And they started finding all these blood imprints and hair samples. And they don't come back as human, but they don't come back as chimpanzee. All they know is it's unknown. some sort of an unknown primate. I'm going to have... When do you guys have to send me a link I'll to the send, show? I'll definitely cause... send it to you. Mr. Ballin covers it a lot. Yeah. And I think it is a missing 411 because people did go missing in that area. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to Mr. Ballin, one of the best storytellers on YouTube Phenomenal right now. Phenomenal storyteller. Yeah, there is second to none. Mr. Ballin knows what he's doing. That's and he, for sure. he sums up so many of these stories that have yeah. nowhere to go. So, like, I trust his opinion a lot. A lot of the missing 411s, he'll sum up in a 20-minute episode instead of an hour and 40-minute episode. Yeah. Yeah, I really liked his his video on that, the Dolshevik Dol- Pass. Is that oh yeah. It? Oh, yeah, oh yeah. Dyatlov. Yeah, yeah, Dyatlov yeah, Pass. yeah, yeah. You did yeah. It's, it's me. It's Dan. I'm gonna fuck up <laughs> every word there is, but intentionally. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, 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 it's Russian. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah. But no, like that story is even crazy. Like the fact that it, it's it's been proven that they say a lot of it was hypothermia. Based when you when Which you look into stuff, which is a lot of bullshit because uh, they disapproved a lot of that. Recently. It's it's crazy. It's crazy they're when you think of some of the stuff. They're saying they're an avalanche path, but it's like two miles of flat land. Yeah, it's, it's not nuts. an avalanche path. There was a video game based on that. Oh god, I'm forgetting what it's called. That was available on Steam, but you are like in this remote mountain area, and you start seeing like Wendigos and stuff. Yeah. Even though I guess Wendigo is a Canadian legend. But. Yeah, Wendigos, and y- you know, you think of the um, uh, what's that 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 trail, Appalachian Trail, like when you think about that and all the mysteries around there. And yeah. man, we're not even touching base on on things like Dogman and and things like that that really get the blood going like oh, some dude, of the that... stories on that i don't even want to get into <laughs> that sort of shit a whole separate cryptid episode like it, that it, would be good it, it just freaks me out but yeah the main thing i notice here with a lot of these stories that we're, we're talking about a lot of them happened before like the 40s a- aside from this 1980s eruption and again we're talking about the helicopters taking things out uh, it, it's speculated that Sasquatch is what eight to nine, sometimes eleven feet tall. Depends gotta, on who's telling the story. Yeah, yeah. you got to think. Well, exactly. It, it, every Sasquatch story is like me catching a fish. It's ten times bigger than what it was. <laughs> Anywhere from six to eleven feet tall. Oh yeah, definitely. And then you think too, the the weight of these things. Like how many of these are they putting on a medical evac to fly out of there? If they're 800 pounds each, like, that's crazy talk. Like, helicopters typically have pretty cramped interiors. Yeah. So, I don't know how you're fitting in a nine-foot-tall, like, you're just eight hundred pound thing. If you put a nine-foot-tall a nine foot tall creature in the back of a helicopter, is the only thing in there. Yeah. Like and you, you better have fuel to get home. You're yeah. stacking them, like, 69-style on top of each other, like, just like, hoping for the best. In the last four years, I spent a lot of time in helicopters. And, like, there's a weight requirement, weight restriction. Yeah. Um, if you look at firefighters, like forest firefighters, they have a specific diet, and they weigh themselves after every meal just so they can, like, when they take off, they got to give their, their weights to the pilot immediately so they know what fuel they can take and what provisions they can take to help them do their job. Yeah. So in a lot of these places where these helicopters go, it's BOGO. Like, you're in and you're out. Once you're past oh, yeah. the point of no return... You're, you're screwed, so you have to be able to get home. Yeah, speaking of BOGO, there's a legend, <laughs> and it's in Boggy <laughs> Creek, guys. Good yeah, segue. let's hear all about Good this one. And, and you know all about, of course, a docudrama about the 
The Folk Monster <laughs> from Folk, Arkansas. Monster seen in the area since the 40s. I'm not exactly sure if you have it on here just glancing through, but I'll send it to you as well. Um, for all of our listeners right now, the Sasquatch Chronicles is a great podcast. Second only to this one that we're hitting with you now. One, one of you guys sent me a, a, a couple links for that. Yeah, that you, was me. You? Yeah, okay. no, they have great stuff. They have people come on and tell their stories. And one of them is actually by a police officer who was called out to a scene and when he got there uh, there was like an abandoned vehicle or something like that people got scared and ran away but when he was there he physically like saw um had his flashlight shining on this thing so obviously the movie is gonna make it like it's gotta be sexy right like it's gotta look cool it's gotta but apparently the movie really kind of tells its own story as to what actually happened there uh of oh nice a remastered version in uh 2019 i'll have to get cat to watch that but yeah a small community in arkansas since the 1940s uh seeing this creature described as being completely covered in reddish brown hair fucking ginger bigfoot <laughs> <laughs> leaving three toe Harry tracks which is something we talked about too like this one is leaving three toe tracks whereas the other bipedal uh footprints they're all five that's, so that's such a big are red there flag subspecies of bigfoot just how like different salamanders different frogs i different mean it apes. depends where they're on the world right exactly. they adapt evolution to their, their, right yeah they adapt to their climate but i feel like every primate has five toes but every, if this thing is in like a swampy area right and you think about um i don't know the place but there's that tribe that literally primarily lives like on the water and yeah. they're like they're, they've like evolved to the point where these villagers could stay underwater for like 13 minutes at a time. Yeah, oh, they're um, which is like their Indian. spleens are Indonesia, bigger, right? Indonesia. Yeah, like yeah. their spleens yeah. are bigger, like things like that. So, but I mean, even if you look at like um, South South American tribes, they're they've lived there barefoot their whole life. Yeah, you look at their feet compared to ours; it's a hundred percent different. And if they're living in a swamp filled environment, they spend most of their time. In and out of water, I can see web t- web feet being a thing. Um, just natural development. I mean, look at Waterworld. Kevin <laughs> Water Costner, World is Kevin a great Costner movie, had man. web toes. Talk about a movie that bombed at the box office, but like saved itself through sheer he, call uh, sheer math. He hates this movie. I love Waterworld math. Just for sheer math, he hates it. It's movie. so plausible. <laughs> I need to, I need I need to watch it so I can. Fully. Well, you can't hate something until you, you fully I know, yourself. I know. Like the fact that the little girl had a map of Shut the up, world on her. Spoiler alert! It's great. <laughs> Spoiler alert! This nineteen ninety two movie. Yeah, but uh, you, movie's you know, almost as old as I am. One of the one of the reports here: father is a farmer. I should say. Hopefully, he's a father as well. <laughs> uh, claiming that this beast carried two one hundred pound hogs with little effort leaping over a fence and in one scene and i love how you got this here a kitten is scared to death <laughs> like i love how you randomly <laughs> got that in there just throw the kitten in for a fact you <laughs> goddamn director you like, <laughs> you gotta, just, like can you imagine that you just see this wild thing and you look over and your kitten's just just having none of it oh man look at your cat did what, you see that and that's what the guy shares like this thing carried 200 and look at my kitten <laughs> like my kitten he's scared but i mean just going from arkansas to florida i want to say it was in the 70s or 80s there was a farmer who was in a tree stand and all of a yeah. sudden all of a sudden he had a doe deer come towards him like she was running away from a predator and then he sat there waiting for a buck to emerge because that's generally what happens like a buck chases the does around yeah he sits there and he waits for a doe, uh, buck to come out, doesn't see anything, and then he sees what he thought was a male in a gorilla suit uh, 200 yards away, kind of where the deer was coming from, stop in a tree, and his first response was like, oh, this is some anti-hunter. Yeah, like, what this is this is guy doing? This is somebody trying to keep me from hunting. And then he put his, his uh, scope on it just to confirm that it was an actual person, and he immediately saw steam rising from the face. 
And he's like, that's not a mask, that's a person. That's that's somebody's face. So he immediately thought, that he didn't think Bigfoot, he was like, something escaped from a zoo yeah. in the area. Like, this is something I don't normally see. But the second he pointed his rifle scope at it, it treated him as a hostile. Yeah. And it started whooping and whistling to something that immediately responded about 100 yards behind him. And, and he was he was literally chased back to his vehicle by two creatures. Like, sprinting on barefoot, they literally funneled him back to his vehicle. I don't like that. Well, and that's something that's talked about a lot, too, is Sasquatch are communal. Mm-hmm. So exactly like you said, right? He raised his rifle, and a lot of people talk like, oh, you need to, you know, obviously science wants a body. But are you going to be that guy who shoots a Bigfoot? And I'm then you got, and, and then you got, well, it, yeah, you are. Yeah. But what's stopping, you know, the other there ones There is going to be a retaliatory So response. you almost need like three or four people because I don't know anyone in Canada who's walking around with a fully automatic AR. Yeah, and, and able to drag a several hundred Even then, even if you have push. a four-shot semi-automatic shotgun, you only got four shots. And that, yeah. Four shots don't generally stop a meth head. I can't imagine they're going to stop oh, a man. Bigfoot. And, and the thing that makes, uh, you know, the folk monster uh, so cool is the fact that this is one of the one of the first reportings that was actually in the newspaper that was yeah. taken pretty seriously because yeah. there's a guy out there you're just talking about shot at it and then he got attacked. Yeah, so apparently the the real story we were talking about the dramatized version, but yeah, 1971 it made headlines. It report it was reported to have attacked the home of Bobby and Elizabeth Ford. Model T baby. <laughs> May 2nd, 1971. According to Elizabeth Ford, the creature, which she initially thought was a bear, reached through the screen window that night while she was sleeping on a couch. It was chased away by her husband and his brother, Don. During the alleged encounter, the Fords fired several gunshots at the creature. They believed they had hit it, although there were no traces of blood. An extensive search of the area failed to locate the creature, but the three-toed footprints, again, that bothers me, were found close to the house, as well as scratch marks on the porch and damage to a window in the house's siding. According to the Fords, they had heard something moving around outside late at night, several nights prior. But having lived in the house for less than a week, they had never incre- and they had never encountered the creature before. Uh, it was apparently sighted again May twenty third of nineteen seventy one, when three people reported seeing an ape-like creature crossing U.S. Highway seventy one. More sightings were made over the following months by local residents who found additional footprints. The best known footprints were found in a soybean field. Belonging to local filling station owner Scott Keith, they were scrutinized by the game warden Carl Gallion, who was unable he was he was unable to confirm their authenticity. And like the Ford prints, it showed the creature only had three toes. Wild. Uh, the incident began to attract substantial interest after news spread about the Ford sighting. Uh, there was a one thousand ninety dollar bounty, weirdly specific. Uh, on the creature. Several attempts were made to track the creature with dogs, but they were unable to follow its scent. Which I guess would make sense in Arkansas, because it's like a swampier area, right? Now, does Arkansas, like, I... Like, they don't have, like, the stereotypical winters that we do, but do, do they get cold? They get below zero. Yeah. But I'm not a lot of snow. Because one thing I'm noticing, like, a lot of these reports kind of stop, and then they pick up again, like, in March to May. So are these things, like, I'm not saying they're like bears and they hibernate, but do they? But I mean, if you look at, look at animal tracks that they're talking about, they say three-toed animals. Yeah. Um, I immediately go webbed feet. That's what I was thinking too. But when you think of a beaver, beavers still have five toes. Yeah, yeah. When you look at their tracks, there's five distinct toes. Like, even if they only have three predominant toes, let's say pinky, middle finger, thumb, those are your predominance. Yeah. They're still going to have some sort of uh, skeletal structure to support the middle parts. Yeah, I just don't see how that's like walkable. <laughs> yeah, it's like well, even even for like geese and things because they have they like, have five. Well, 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 because well, they, they have like the they have the front toes. Yeah, it was and the, you can the, see you can see the webbing between them all, and, and you, you can, can see still the skeletal. Yeah, well, we're, yeah, we're talking to the master of missing toes when especially it comes to walking, <laughs> especially for birds. So, right? so, so you know what I mean? Like if if, 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 if Gareth if can do it, if they're tracking me, there's no confusion. Yeah, yeah. All you gotta do is not be on a trail, and you'll probably find Gareth. That's awesome. He makes his own drill. But, you know, like, a quick quick segue, like, yeah. 30, 30 seconds here. Uh, getting back to Sasquatch Chronicles, 
a lot of people talk about things happening in these areas, like the dense areas of Arkansas, and yeah. they just take care of it themselves. But there's a lot of, and you have to remember, in Arkansas area, that was a big moonshining community. Yeah. So a lot of cryptids in that area. Like, if you look at Forrest Galante or any of those other bi biologists that love cryptids, they look into that aspect of things. Like, there was a, a red wolf that was seen killing people in the Arkansas area for generations. That's wild. But it was I'm just... I'm with that one. But it was literally just a hoax put on by moonshiners to keep locals out of the area. Yeah. Because that was a big... That's where they made their money, right? Yeah, They're not going to have... They don't want right. people stomping around that area. Folklore helped a lot of that. And then I try and take that mentality for that one aspect of the world to everywhere else. Like, a lot of... Bigfoot sightings are on um, uh, Murder Mountain there in California. I forget the actual name of the mountain. Oh, I know the one you're talking about. But it, it's huge in the weed-growing community. Oh, yeah. And there's tons of cartel that are in that area. Actually, there's a documentary that came out, I want to say, in the last 10 years of a guy looking into murders on the building that were said to be on the mountain, sorry, that were said to be Bigfoot but were actually cartel or growers well, yeah. that would literally butcher people to keep people off of their land. Well, yeah. Such a fine line, right? Like you think about moonshining, you want to be somewhere where nobody's going to find it, but it still needs to be easy enough for you to get your product yeah, out. Yeah, like right? logistics yeah. have to make yeah. sense. And the best way to keep people out of your territory was folklore. Exactly. Like that just well, makes sense. In, in going back, like Native Americans, hey, like don't go into the water, champ will get you. Like things like that when we talk about sea monsters and, and a lot and of their like stories that. though Lake like Champlain. when you, if you get to a community and the entire community is scared of an area it's because they've pushed themselves into that area and have reasons to be scared yeah well, that's yeah. my general philosophy especially like i worked up a lot up north um the inuk up there the inuit people they believe in these small human humanoids it's okay. like one of their big things they call them tricksters They'll call children out into the into the white tundra during blizzards. Uh, that's a big thing up there. Yeah. yeah, that's right up there with chimpanzees. Fuck off. Yeah, don't trust them. But, like, whenever there's a blizzard out there, any of the elders would be like, if you see a child out in the blizzard, it's not a child. Stay away from them. They're calling you out there. No, they sure. want you to die. And there's a... I wouldn't say it's 100% what the folklore is, but there's a reason... For these stories, mm -hmm. they came from somewhere. There's a there's a plot behind them, and the general rule of knowledge, in my opinion, when it comes to First Nations or Inuit, is the betterment of the tribe, the betterment yeah. of the community. It's not, hey, stay out of here because this is where the gold is. We don't want you to have access to it. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey. Don't go there because you will be murdered. Something bad will happen to you when you go onto that land. They were very, and still are, obviously not they were, they are very respectful of nature and all that it's given to them. So, yeah. right, like they, they kill an animal and before they put it out of its misery, they say a little prayer. So, um, highly believable that if there's something in an area, hey, you do your thing, we'll do our thing. Well, even if you go back and you look at Portlock and you look at all those other communities, um, it's not like they had the internet. Oh, These are communities yeah. that, like, might you might get a, a tablet off of one of their news reports back mm -hmm. home. But you look at Portlock, you look at places like that, um, this whole town's been evacuated because something in the nature is killing everyone. But the locals, the First Nations or the Inuk, Inuit, will straight up be like, no, this is what's killing everybody. Yeah. They automatically know what is happening in the area. We just, as Europeans, dis disagree with their outlook or think it's all bullshit. Mm -hmm. I think it says it's dying. That battery is dead. That's okay. I have a second battery. Get a up. second battery, Todd Stanley. I thought we were professionals here. <laughs> yeah, man. What the hey diddly D? The actor's life for me. <laughs> So, yeah, that, that makes so many good points. And you think, too, right? Like, animals, wild animals, they don't really, like, give you so much of a warning. Like, they might bluff charge you and stuff like that. But if an animal attacks you, it, it's attacking you to take you out. For a reason. You're either a threat yeah. or competition. There's not really anything else. So that's the part that really you're gets a threat, believ your food, believable. Or your competition. Yeah, that stuff's freaky and yeah you touch base on the on the bounty here as well uh, i love that they temporarily enforced a no guns policy 
in place to preserve public safety. So again, we're talking about, you know, the rednecks and hillbillies going out there with their guns just shooting at anything. It got to the point where, hey, there's something bipedal walking there and it's just me going Let's through not kill it all, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. like, oh, this you're six foot six, buddy. <laughs> like, we're taking you out, so... That sort of stuff kind of freaks me out. Well, then, like, everyone's always like, it's modern technology. There's always issues with, like, how come we don't have, like, realistic footage of any of these things or, like, definitive pictures of all these things. But, like, this was 2023. 20, I took this picture of an Arctic wolf who was following me. He's 200 yards away. I had to zoom in. Would you say that's a very high definition picture? Nah, not really. Like you oh, can tell what it that is, up to but the camera as well. Just and if that were me, I'd be like, "Oh, Wayne, you got a cute dog. Where did you get him from?" He, he's <laughs> well over two hundred pounds. That's wild. And he followed me for quite a while, but like he like the only way I would have known he was there is somebody told me about him. Yeah. He's over two hundred yards away in the tundra. Granted, there's not a lot of things in the tundra. But everything that's up there blends in very well with everything else. Uh, you know, since the initial clusters of these sightings in 1970, there have been sporadic reports of the creature. In the 90s, there was one in 91. Yeah. Um, and in 97 and into 98, the creature was reportedly sighted. Um, sorry, the one in 91, it was seen jumping off a bridge. And then in 97, 98, it was reportedly sighted in the Dry Creek bed uh, five miles from the actual town. So do these things maybe, you know, if the heat get out of the kitchen type thing and maybe it migrates or who knows? I mean, there's there's even footage recently of people on Vancouver Island out hiking in areas that they don't normally hike and they have footage of Bigfoot. Granted, it's something blurry in the distance Mm -hmm. as all other footage we have is yeah but i'm noticing a trend i feel like even if this thing were somewhat migratory the way this is described is so different from the way the bigfoot is described in the pacific northwest that it would have to be a different species well and you're well, talking too right like we're just talking white tails little white tails from northern yeah. alberta to southern alberta but they still have the same number of hooves so the like, same number like, of hooves but sure. like, like the three toes and the red hair this well that could be a different thing okay imagine well look at lions in africa there was islands that were, or lions that were cut off from the rest of every other pride in Africa. The only source of food was, I think it was Cape Buffalo. Oh, with, we're within that, 10 years. That island with the super lions? With it, within 10 years, those lions' entire body shape and muscular skeleton, or muscular. Anyways, they were double the size. It's fucking jacked. Shit. Yeah, they oh, yeah. were jacked. And the reason why is because all they were doing all the time was hunting Cape Buffalo. Yep. I mean, that's that's predominant in most species. Oh, God, I forget the name of that documentary. But once species get isolated, they evolve and become their own species. 100%. I mean, just because me and you, let's say, Waterworld, for example, I grew up on solid land, you grew up on a boat, and you evolved webbed feet. There's a reason for it. You get to Shane Gillies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you get the old Kevin Costner gills. But, I mean, you look at... Most of nature is like that. Actually, you'd like this. Do you do you follow Forrest Galante at all? Do you know who he is? I have no idea, my man. <laughs> he is a uh, biologist, but he hunts cryptids. He goes around oh, the world. Okay. He has a YouTube channel. He did the last Shark Week. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. like, he go. He's the guy that looking for the Tasmanian tiger. He's the guy. He found tortoises in um, South America that everyone thought was extinct. Yeah. He found, uh, I think it was a leopard in Asia that everyone thought was extinct, but it's still alive. Sure. Is this the gentleman, the guy who's always on the Joe Rogan He's show? on Joe Rogan. Okay. He talks times. about cryptids yeah. all the time. Okay, I know who you're talking about. He's younger that, guy, like, he's got he's yeah, the blonde. sexy guy. He's from South Africa. <laughs> Allegedly <laughs> found the 50-foot python. Good. No, no, he guy. didn't find that python. No, no that, is no, that the, the, the No, he wasn't there's him a at fo- all. The fo- there's a photo. 27-foot long anaconda. Yeah, of a... A taken guy from a helicopter. With. No, no, there's a guy swimming with an anaconda that's swimming. You're talking about a, a I, I, video I, yeah. or photo from Africa. Yeah, I in think the I Congo. got the two mixed up. Yeah, no, you're talking about a 1930s footage from a military. Which is crazy. Yeah, it was a military. Uh, I can't remember if he was Air Force or not, but he was respected. And the one picture he got was he estimated the snake to be over 100 feet long. Forrest Galante is the guy that says the Congo is the only place in the world that doesn't have a large snake. 
So it makes sense for him, in his mind, that that region would have a large snake. He's just, he doesn't believe that the amount of human traffic in that area hasn't yeah. come across it yet. And, you know, you bring this guy up, too, and that's a great point. Like, we were just talking about how uh, the natives and, and the people who were first on the land, how they respect areas great point because he wanted to see giant snakes and it was like the anaconda movie the villagers refused to go past for a certain reason. point because they know yeah <laughs> so but getting back to forest one of his things that he recently brought up in the last five years you know the whole um what's his name uh not caviguera southern states northern mexico cryptid chupacabra and chupacabra El chup he, he believes that the whole chupacabra thing and like the timeline of when it started in that area was at the same time that a ship was coming from Australia with the Tasmanian tiger on it. He believes that there was a breeding population of Tasmanian tiger that were shipwrecked off the coast of Mexico. Oh. I heard the same and story. All of the chupacabra stuff of like animals being bitten by the throat, that's how the, the Tasmanian tiger kills. It oh. grabs the throat and kills them. Didn't suck blood. I've never heard this. Rumor. Well, and the chupacabra yeah. wasn't a thing until like the late nineties, and, the, the and whole then all thing, of a sudden it's everywhere. And the whole thing was in that area. Yeah. There was a shipment of I want to say they're one of the San Diego Zoo, but there was Tasmanian tigers that were shipped to North America, and that ship went down. Oh man, I'm gonna you, go down this you rabbit can't, hole today. No man, you can't tell me when we have all these places that are like literally designing and coming up with different pathogens and diseases oh. that were not manipulating animals. Forest Delante, in my mind, is right up there with, like, every other, like, he's the I want to believe guy. He's not, I believe these things definitively. I will prove it if I can prove it. If I can disprove it, I will disprove it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the Tasmanian tiger sightings, he says, are mangy coyotes or yeah. foxes, whatever, what have you. And he speaks in a way that anyone but can, can understand. His too. big one yeah. that he wants to go research in areas that I've been, not into the depth and level that he's been, um, is in like in the Amazon. Like I was in Peru mostly, in the Amazon jungle rainforest. Mm -hmm. um, but he wholeheartedly believes that there's a giant sloth still out there, an eight foot carnivorous omnivorous omnivorous sorry mm -hmm. uh, sloth that's bigger than any bear in North America. But it's just in these rural, I, I do wonder why mountainous he regions. That so strongly. Just from being around the world, and experiences climates and situations that can support that kind of life. Mm -hmm. Like he'll notice outliers. Like he notices when there's a place like the Congo. He says everywhere else in the world that has the same standards of life have giant snakes. The Congo oh, is yeah. the only place on the planet that doesn't have a recorded giant snake. That meets that yeah. level of criteria. And, and when you go to the Congo, there's all these reports. Even reports uh, that we've seen on river monsters of the, t the tiger fish. Oh, uh, yeah. Yep, the with the tiger giant fish. teeth, which was a rumor until the 1990s. Yeah. Again, free fish. Because the Congo River is so oh, insane. Yeah. And Man. then you get the, the perch out of Lake Victoria. They're like 30, 40 pound perch. And, and, you know, to stick with my theme of messing words up, the Hapu Hubende, the giant dinosaur that apparently... Mokeli Mbembe. There, there you dinosaur, go. Yeah, <laughs> man. Apparently, right? Like, you bring these books and you're asking these different uh, people, villagers, like, hey, what did you see? And you're pointing at, like, a giant dinosaur. And then this guy's pointing. And they drew these things without knowing what they are. Yep. So... That, without any, that's without that's any sorts of reference, they describe creatures that are already in existence. And, or and footprints. They found footprints yep. there, too, that have all been casted and oh stuff God, like We're going to have to do a separate episode on like just all the other cryptids that aren't ape men. You know what I mean, we're missing? Even ape men. You go to like northern Tibet, the Yeti. There's a oh, whole yeah. communal town where it, their whole religion is based around a hand of a Yeti. That's a mummified hand. And from... the scalp. I just listened yeah. to a BBC episode about that. Yeah. Oh, I love they BBC. Took a, they took a... Fucking hell. They took a <laughs> they DNA did, sample, Yeah, they right? did a bone sample, and it was human. It wasn't 100% human. I'll have to send you the For link. For this podcast, For, it's <laughs> inconclusive. <laughs> it's inconclusive, guys. Uh, 
Final final thing I want to hit on today, because we're hitting an hour and a half now. Uh, something that we all love, Missing 411. We love missing people. It scares the shit out of me. No, Missing 411, uh, David Politis is the one who mainly got this going, right? Like, going to these different national parks, he's just hiking, and all these strange disappearances that have happened... And what makes these cases different than the ones, um, you know, obviously hikers go missing every day, Mm -hmm. but people will go search the areas where these people went missing, have a giant perimeter, not come across anything, and then years later, they come come across. And um, like an example of a lost hiker, it happened on the Appalachian Trail. You can look it up on YouTube, this poor elderly lady. Uh, needed to go to the washroom, so she stepped off the trail to relieve herself, couldn't find the trail again. And unfortunately, she passed away in the elements. They found her. She had written a diary of exactly what happened. She just got lost. Yeah. Now, there's all these other ones where what makes it so crazy, and I see that you have it here, is a lot of these people who are abducted, they have physical disabilities, And what makes that so crazy, people, oh, that's not a thing, that's not a thing. But if you're a bear, if you're any apex predator, you're not chasing down the strongest deer. No. You're taking out the sickly, you're taking out the elderly. So that's why missing 411 to me is just so plausible that it is an apex predator because it is the people with disabilities who are going missing, people with hearing issues, People yeah. with a limp, uh, physically smaller in in, in nature. So yeah. it all started with this David Polites guy getting called in to look into some missing persons cases, and it turned out there was a weird amount of missing people that were going missing in the national parks in thousands, the United States. Thousands of people going missing, and, and no, no one dad. had been like, well, yeah, nobody had been correlating all these missing people within the parks because there was no, I guess like, National Park Police Service that was investigating all of these cases. So, there like there have been a lot of weird links that were found, like, links between the majority of the missing persons cases and nearby cave systems. Yeah. Links between people going missing who had physical or mental disabilities. Or, I listened to a recent interview with David Polites, and he was talking about how a weird number of, like, German physicists were going missing, too. Like, just very specific groups of people were going missing in ways that couldn't be... I guess, understood. And, like, there were a lot of theories about what was going on. Was it organized crime or cryptids or aliens or cults or something? Uh, Polites, to his credit, he is very much not focused on what is taking these people because he feels like it'll impact his credibility. And yeah, he he's a cop. This. He's a police through and through. He's, he's a skeptic. Yeah. Like, yeah. He, he points the facts at you, and that's it. Right? Which it, you should do. If yeah. it's children going, and he approaches it from a police detective. Yeah. So it's literally fact-based evidence. Yeah. So from kids going missing and being found 24 hours later, 500 miles up the side of a mountain, unscathed. Yeah. Perfectly when you, fine. Uh-huh. When you ask a four-year-old what happened, she goes, well, the gorilla kept me safe from the bears. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay. Cool. And nobody looks further into it because the kid was found healthy and unharmed no scratches no nothing some of these kids describing like not even it being nighttime like it just stayed day the whole time yeah. and then you have other uh stories where you know a child goes missing um and hikers hiking in a spot that was checked five years earlier come across a pile of clothing that's folded and a mountain lion did it I know some cougars that might fold my clothes, <laughs> but never mountain lions. And never for free. Never for free. <laughs> so, like, skeptics are saying that there are no unusual connections between all these cases. I really feel like anyone that's made it this far into the episode, do yourself a favor, listen to some interviews with David Polites, because any missing 411 investigation that he has documented... There's always something weird going on, you know, missing in national parks, you know, skewing towards younger people, skewing towards physicists for some reason. Uh, there's a map that appears in one of the Missing 411 documentaries, which has it's been widely shared on social media, and it shows the map of disappearances overlaid with the map of American cave systems. 
which freaked the hell out of me because I don't know if you guys have ever done much spelunking before, yeah. but fucking spelunking. <laughs> Cave diving, cave exploring. No, bro, I, I'm good, man. I could barely fit into my damn pants. It's weird, man. One of the caves that my wife and I went to, um, we actually did have to like exhale and squeeze between the rocks in that one area. That scares me, guys. Uh, Is that Cadman? Yes, Cadman yeah. Caves. I grew up around there. Um, the I don't Cadman think, Cave creature. I, I don't think we're allowed in it's anymore bats. because of the, uh, yeah, it's closed. the white nose yeah, syndrome yeah, the, yeah, the, 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 the old bat. Or white nose fungus. Uh, but like one example that I wanted to point out was... There was a missing woman in Las Cruces, Cruces? New Mexico. New Mexico. Yeah. She was extremely disabled, legally blind. She had short-term memory loss issues. Um, and there had there, there is a cluster of missing people that have gone missing at the Chiricahua National Monument in Arizona. Just to touch base, she was in her 70s, early 80s, correct? I forget her age. She was with somebody and they were looking for well, she was, yeah, no, she oh, was hiking oh, with her mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, she, she wasn't that old. Um, okay, okay. But this it's the, also the only monument where an on-duty national park warden went missing and was never found. Um, th- like, whenever park wardens go missing as well, it's extra creepy whenever people go missing from, like, you know, fire watch towers or stuff. It's, well, it's always a, you touched on, the, on the, the, the fire tower. Like, there was someone, I believe, in Alberta within the last five years, a, a woman oh God, that, should, would, that was literally that. taken, yeah. like, never to be seen again. And these are one of the towers, too, where you have to physically, like, you, you, you go in, you climb up. Like, mm-hmm. a lot of them have your living accommodations, but they're yeah. on the bottom. So, um, yeah, and she never basically responded to her last radio call to check in nope. and then gone. So And they, they contribute a lot of that to feral people. I, I jump on that. I totally agree. And I could see that happening for the amount of, like, not, you know, we do have a homeless problem, but there are a lot of people out there who are still in touch with their roots when it comes to the survival aspect. I mean, even recently, I want to say it was the mid-90s, late 2000s, early 2000s, sorry, of a man, I want to say he was in the Washington, D.C. area, New York area. Um, he lived in the woods for 30 years. Yeah, I, I saw that. Way, the like, only reason why the he got... pond hermit or something? The only reason why he got caught was because he kept robbing, um, like, hunting properties and yeah. like, vacation properties. He would take... For 30 years, he'd go to a summer camp and take whatever he could out of their fridge and stuff. Yeah. But he lived for 30 years in the bush by himself in oh, the yeah. same tent. And, like, it's a, it's a common camping area mm-hmm. like it happens all the time and there's people of people people stories of people going through um different trails like there's a trail going from mexico up into canada um there's reports of feral people harassing people on the trail there for, um, for me feral people is the creepiest but also the most plausible well, well i mean you the get, hills have eyes is based on a true story like yeah they highly jacked it up and put it on steroids yeah but there legitimately was a cave where a, a town of people went and they yeah it was it was a cave full of like basically not to make it sound weird but an incest family that was killing and eating people and stealing their materials for their survival yeah so it's it's wild. Like, yeah, it's nothing like the movie where they're dragging <laughs> you at the stake. And then if, but... if you want to get back to Bigfoot issues and stuff like that, I want to say it was the late 60s, early 70s, there was a predominant safari hunter. He would go out into, the, the, into Africa, and he would hunt lions solo. He would hunt all these apex predators by himself, often using himself as bait. He was hunting, I want to say it was in the main area, and he went silent. They couldn't hear anything from him. A couple of weeks later, they went to his camp and they found rem- like where his body was. And there was no animal predation on his body. There was no animal predation on any of his supplies. And the cause of death, which the, the government posted, was that he was squeezed to death by a black bear. Don't like that. Yeah, see, that's crazy. And- black bears don't have the ability to squeeze people. Oh Period. yeah, and they don't have they don't hug people. For all right, okay, all right. I, I'm, I'm going to stop you right there. Have you never heard of a bear hug? Yeah, but that's usually generally by me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the the crazy thing that I'm noticing here, like going through your notes, is just how many stories. Like you, you got a point here. Like woman is out hiking with her mom. Mom needs to use the restroom. 
Other yeah. woman says she'll walk back to her car. Mom's gone for one minute, never sees the daughter again. Yeah. And how many stories are like that where yeah. I'm just walking behind you, you turn around, and I'm gone. Yep. Never to yep. be seen again. There's my fishing pole, like there's my bait, and I'm just gone. And, yep. another, another and you don't even hear a... Like, and like, dogs, dogs can't track it. Exactly. Which is, Never happens. Or they do, and eventually, like you said, like they, they, they get to a certain area, and then it doesn't make sense that the scent is gone. No, they'll bring like in other dogs. Like, it doesn't make any yeah. sense. They'll bring in a less route. Well, well, yeah. How is the Strong dog getting... Strong <laughs> How is the dog getting closer to you when the scent is becoming weaker? It, yeah, it just... It or the dogs get sense. scared. Yeah. Which, for police scent dogs to get scared, that's... Not normal. Well, you yeah. hear some of these like stories. Even again, uh, Les talks about it at, on one of his shows. Uh, his BC episode, Port. Uh, fuck, where is it? Cork Quindlem or whatever the hell it is. Yes, yeah. thank you guys. And my serial killer guys, you'll know that that was uh, <laughs> what's his nuts' favorite place, the Hot Dog Man. Picton, Robert Picton. Oh, that, shit. That I've never heard guy. him called the hot dog man. Yeah, that yeah. Was, yeah, well, he he fed everybody to pigs and then Gosh, slaughtered his shit. pigs, turned them into hot dogs. That's another episode. Fuck. But no, he talks about a story of a guy who had like four or five mastiffs with him. And those dogs wouldn't come out of the tent, man. Like they're and if you're if that's me and I'm surrounded by five giant dogs and they're not leaving the tent, like bro, I'm leaving at first day. Oh yeah, there's, there's a similar. There. Uh, I think Mr. Ballin covers covers it and missing four one one. Yeah, a family in the Portland area, they go uh, camping and they go to a campground that's actually quite full. So they were able to get a campsite, but it was on the very outskirts. Yeah. of a very remote campground. And they had two German Shepherds with them. And when they're out hiking one day, one of their dogs found another campsite with a camp. Uh, the tent was still there, but it was crushed. So it looked like it had something large, like cattle, he assumed, had stomped all over it. They found a propane tank that was completely flattened. Oh. Which completely is... Completely flattened. That's not cattle. And no. since they found that campsite, neither of his German Shepherds would calm down to the point where he kept his dogs inside the truck when they went back to their campsite. But he couldn't sleep, so he set up a perimeter, and while he was setting up a perimeter, he found someone else's perimeter that was already been set up. Crazy. And, like, throughout the night, at one point, both of his dogs stood up and ran to the bush to a point, and then they stopped dead. One of his dogs wet themselves. Both big German shepherds trained to protect the family. You're freaking me out. (laughs) But it got to the point where he pulled out his pistol, got his family out of their tents, and they slept in the car until morning, and then they drove out of there. Yeah. You know, the missing 411, guys, We, it was June 1969. We the, the creepiest story that really got me going down the missing 411, we got to talk about little mm-hmm. Dennis Martin. Yeah. Like, six years old, with his father, grandfather, brother... Uh, they go on a hike to a natural, uh, natural area. You gotta, I'm purposely screwing oh, up words. You gotta love it. Uh, for Father's Day, they run into another family. A weird coincidence. They're also the Martins. Uh, it's since been uh, discovered the family talking about Dennis having a learning disability. Um, they wanted to play hide and seek. I don't see it in the notes, but Dennis on that day was wearing a bright red shirt. So Pretty, all the, yeah, so yeah. all the other brothers were hiding in one area, and they said, "Hey, no, you go hide over there because they didn't want to be spotted." Mm-hmm. So essentially, like Dennis goes, uh, his father watches him go behind this tree. They yell, "Hey, pop out!" He doesn't pop. He's out. gone, man. Since 1969, which is two years after the last Leaf Stanley Cup, <laughs> the um, <laughs> but no trace. The National Guard came out for that. Green Berets came out. Green from that. Berets, like there were they hundreds of volunteers, never found them. Of course, there was a heavy rainfall that day. It's been speculated. A lot of people talk about um, like shafts, like uh, Mine lava, shafts. like lava yeah, tubes yeah. and whatever. Lava like flows. he, he could have just fallen in there. You're never gonna see him again. But none of those came out exactly. In the search part. and there wasn't anything around that area that that would explain. He was suspected that. to be attacked by a mountain lion, but Les Stroud was actually involved in that one. Yeah, and he says there's no evidence of a mountain lion attack whatsoever. So again, it rains heavily for seven uh, seven days in a row, and this is where it gets creepy. This is where the Bigfoot stuff comes in because mm-hmm. at the same time. And Wayne touched on this uh, earlier where 
you'll be in one area and then like miles away, like there's a sighting. So the key family pulls up, you know, they're talking to a, a park ranger. They want to see bears. They want to see black bears. Yeah. So, uh, the park ranger hasn't heard anything about anybody going missing, obviously. So he says, Hey, why don't you like go check out this area, stay in your car, be safe. And they're in that area. They happen to look and I believe it was uh, the daughter is like, hey, like, what is that? And they look and they say what they saw was what looked like a bear holding Dennis. Well, a, a red, they saw the red shirt and it was just bucking it through the woods. Yep, they said a bear had him th- thrown over his yeah. shoulder. But bears can't physically do that. They don't do that. If they're carrying anything, it's in their mouth. They don't throw anything over their shoulder. They don't wear backpacks. So yeah, like again, sorry, it's the twelve-year-old son points up, like, "Hey, that looks that looks like a bear." Um, the next morning, the key family reads the story about the missing boy. They come forward with what they uh, what they saw. They call the FBI, uh, offer to show them where it was. The FBI doesn't want them going back into the park. Wants to uh, interview them at their house. And again, on the file, there's no mention of the key family um, or anything like that. And, and, and something you don't have written here, but one of the craziest things about this story is the FBI agent who is primarily in charge with this case unalived himself at a later right. date. And it's highly, highly speculated that it's because they know a lot more than what they're telling, right? Yep. And it's to the point where it's so unbelievable that they just... What are you going to do? And and this gentleman, too, the father, um, Father Key, we'll call him, he was legitimately interviewed, I think, just as early as maybe maybe a decade ago, in his 90s, old guy, sharp as a tack still, told the whole story. Um, and he was more on the train of how we brought up, he thought it could be a feral individual. Mm. Yeah, I, I heard his story yeah. and the way he sounded, that he even did a lie detector. He believes it was a feral, like someone like a pedophile. Yeah. No. Victimizing his kid. But the sheer lack of evidence just proves that. Well, and it doesn't make sense just the distance covered. In the short period of time. Like, they, they yeah. did yeah. say that it's doable, but at the same time, in that terrain. For that age of a child. It's yeah. It, it's, it's just not. No. And again, I think I could be mistaken, but I believe there's actually another elderly woman who says that she saw like a little boy standing on like a ridge line and he was looking and it was almost as if like you're at a comedy shop and you do shitty, just pulled like right off, like just grabbed wow. and pulled back. I didn't so, that one. And again, right? Like, actually, in, you know. There's talk. I know the stories you're talking about. I know the area you're talking about it. I forget the names. I know there's a Mr. Ballin story about it. There's a Missing 411 about it. And the only reason why I didn't make the four, Missing 411 documentaries is because the kids were left unharmed. Yeah. But the main story is these two kids were playing in the backyard, playing catch or whatever, what have you. They throw one of the toys and it goes into the wood lines. Uh, the younger sibling asks, I think it was a girl, she asked the older brother to go get it and all of a sudden the object came out of the bush and so the older boy kicks it back into the bush and he sees it get thrown even further in so they go in to get it and as they go in to get it they see something they believe is their father messing with them about 75 yards away hiding behind a tree so they go run to that I think the oldest child at this point is 12 and they do this three or four times where they see something hiding behind the tree and they go run to try and catch it and then the oldest child looks back and realizes that they're far from home and they realize the whole point of all of this was to get them away from their home. And even the little girl said, we need to go home. Like a fish to a lure. And right? they both ran back home being chased the whole way. And even the toy that they were playing with was left in the backyard for them to come get. Ugh. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, there's a YouTube channel. I'll send it to you. Uh, anybody wants to check it out. It's actually Bob Gimlin, not yeah. the Bob Gimlin. But uh, a guy that has the same handle, and he tells a story, same thing, like back in in the U.S. I'll have to get the exact uh, story, well, exact location, but I know the story. Same thing, apparently a little juvenile Sasquatch 
was actually playing with kids and like in a farmhouse and like they were physically actually playing and then same thing there was one night where like the the parents happened to see it and they shot this thing and <sighs> and they buried it and um obviously they can't find where they buried it or they don't want to disclose where it was buried but apparently in today's day and age it happens quite a bit in like rural canada and the u.s where a farmer just takes one of these things out and then they bury it never to be heard of again look at half of the the mining or uh forestry industry in brazil mm. think they announce every time they run into no. a village no no no, you can't. Every time they run into a fossil or a giant creature, no, they put it down and bury it. The Valley of the Headless Men. <laughs> Man, <I laughs> Which is on awesome my area. guide. I'm planning on going to in the next five yeah, years. Yeah, I, I really want to check that place out as well. I know it's probably one of the only places in Canada where there, there's places where you are. It's like illegal to go to, isn't it? Like I'm there's certain sure. parts of the park. Yeah, as far as I know, you can go to all parts. Um, there's a whole bunch of areas that it's not recommended that you go. Okay. Um, there's parts of the river that apparently get over a thousand feet deep, which I call bullshit on. Yeah. Um, it's just not realistic in any waterway river that I know of in North America. Um, but yeah, the stories that come out of there and Portlock as well. Like I worked in that area enough now that I know people that used to do tours into mm -hmm. the Valley of Headless Men or Nahani Valley. Yeah. So that's definitely on my bucket list in the next 10 years is to at least go out there for a month and just record, man. Well, and that's what you record. need. Like, you need to be in a spot for more than a weekend. You got to be able to yeah. call bullshit. You yeah, can't you call bullshit to. within 48 hours. Because, like, if you go out there, say, just for a weekend, like myself, like, any sound I hear is going to tighten my house right up. Well, and just think about, like, uh, all the animals we've touched base on. Like, cougars, bobcats, foxes, they all make oh my crazy <laughs> sounds. And she's dead. Oh, goodness. I think that are <laughs> Just, just shutting off, doing its own thing. The GoPro. But yeah. Oh, I, there we go. I have. She's back. I yeah. have three ways into the Honey Valley. I don't know if it overheated. Oh, it's fine, man. This is this is a <laughs> heated subject. The man. only thing I've been told about staying in the Honey Valley is like don't stay in a tent. Yeah. If you can stay on a boat, stay on a boat. Um, have some sort of structure with you, because most of the creatures in that area don't know man. Yeah. If you put something new in that area, they're going to come investigate it. Mm -hmm. Even if it's innocent, try and minimize your contact with local... Yeah, I think a place like that, I'd almost want to physically build like a blind or well, some sort of... I looked at a renting. Story. I looked at a renting river boats in that area. You can get a jet boat that you could put a tent on. Yeah. And you're far enough offshore that if something comes on the boat, you're going to know it. And generally, predators in that area aren't going to go swim into. Brother, out. I don't know what I would do. You. you just see this Bigfoot, like in the Marine movies, just oh. like, right here, like <laughs> popping its nose line up. I'd be like, see ya. <laughs> just a grizzly hopping yeah, on the back like, of the boat. Like, here you go, man. Here, you, this is all you. Don't get me wrong, I will be heavily armed in any one of these situations. And, and Good. You, talking about that, like, that is the only reason why I've looked into getting my firearms permits is because at the 1% chance that there is something out there like that. Oh, I mean, just you even, know? even me in places that me and him go fishing. Like... We get grizzly tracks. I mean, we went fishing a month ago. We had a black bear just across the river from us. Yeah. Granted, it's a black bear. He's probably not going to do too much. Area I had never seen a bear. Like, it makes sense for no. a bear to be up there. And a lot of places we fish are very moosey. So, mm -hmm. like, being armed just kind of makes sense. I mean, at, at some point, it's just negligent not to be. Totally. Like, uh, I, I, could, I could pretend to be Rambo all I want. I ain't going to go out a 10-foot grizzly with a no. six-foot, six-inch knife. Uh, to round out the episode, uh, this one's not really Bigfoot related, but, uh, Dan, you had a story. Bros. <laughs> I've been uh, waiting to hear this story. Okay, here we go. So, I, I work for Edmonton Public... Uh, schooling, custodian. I'm not going to say where I was sent, but I recently had an assignment at a school, and I'm there, and a couple of... Uh, I noticed that, like, some lights are flickering, toilets are flushing on their own, so I talked to the guys I work with, and they're like, oh, man, yeah, like, three people died here in this building. I'm bullshit. Like, okay. Yeah, mess with so, the new guy. Exactly, mess with the new guy. So... 
I go home, I tell my wife all about it. My wife works uh, for a construction company that takes on a lot of contracts, schools being like a big one. So come to find out actually that back in 2011, a gentleman did die at that school. He had like a roof joust fall on him and crushed him on site. Now what's crazy about this is the room where the lights were flickering the joust that fell is literally holding up that room. Now, when you say joust, you mean Joyce? Yeah, like exactly. I, I, I didn't want to do it. Thank you, guys. Well, you guys exactly. got to help me out, bro. Come on. Okay. Because so, I'm thinking joust, there's like... Jousting. Jousting. jousting yeah, lines. thank you. It's a true story. I just don't know English. <laughs> don't hang joust. It's his ceiling. first and third language, guys. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, my wife tells me, yeah, no, somebody did pass away there. She sends me, like, all the documentation and, and everything. I know the gentleman's name. I'm not going to say his name because just in case, right? Like, I, mm-hmm. I just, it's it's not cool. So um, I find out this guy's name, and me being Dan, I'm at the school the next day. So every time I do something, I say this guy's name. I'm like, oh, like, uh, we'll say his name's Greg. I'm like, oh, hey, Greg. Uh, what's going on, Greg? Like, the toilet flushes, like, after I say his name a couple times. So I'm like, okay, this is kind of crazy. I'm in the music room where my encounter happened. The lights flicker, and I look, and the storage room light turns on. I go into the storage room. All the cupboards are open. I don't like that. And I'm like, cool. But what I read about this guy, like, in his obituary, like, he was a really fun, loving, joking kind of guy. Never never felt threatened at all. Not yeah. one time. So I close him all. I'm like, Greg, you son of a bitch. Like, at least vacuum the floor. So um, I go on about my day, and two days go by, and we're there on a PD day. And I have a couple missed calls on my phone, and I'm like, what, like, Okay. And my wife is texting me like, hey, you got to pick up your phone. Like the lawyer you got a hold of is trying to reach you. I'm like, I never talked to a lawyer. Like, I don't know what, like what? Yeah. So I listen to the voicemail and it's like, hey, like this had to do with like a workplace accident. We don't really cover those. But if you need some advice, like we can get you some phone numbers. So I call them back, leave them a voicemail. I never called you guys. I don't know what's going on. Uh, and what makes it crazy is they called my wife, who I have as my emergency contact, and they knew my name. Like, they knew Dan. So, um, go on about my day. The, the lady calls me back. I'm talking to her. And she's like, yeah, like, you you called a couple days ago. We talked because, like, uh, like a workplace injury, like, happened. And I was, I never called you. I have no idea what you're talking about. And she's like, well, do you want to, like, at least like like hear what happened and i'm like sure like what happened and she said that i called and reported that i worked with someone who died at like where i was two days prior and two days prior was when like i went up to greg and did the old TLC ghost documentary thing and was like, hey, Greg, if you don't know that you passed away, like, it's okay to go to the other side. Like, you died so uh, instantly that you're probably confused and have no clue. And then, yeah, I got a phone call like two days later saying that I was involved with someone who died due to a workplace injury. And I have no idea, like, how they got my wife's number. The only thing I'm kicking myself in the ass for is I should have asked for the name of the person who passed away. Yeah. But I didn't. Yeah. And, and so I'm like, and if they would have said, like, his name, I would have been like, wow. Yeah. But what makes it crazier is I obviously, like, after that happened, I was, like, looking up uh, the obituary and things like that. And there's a couple statements made by a Richard Parker and when I introduced myself, I said my whole name. So I'm wondering if, like, you know, some weird ghostly stuff. But it's crazy because after I left that school and went home and, like, had a night's sleep, I've never felt, like, like just this crazy peace come over me. And it was, like, wild. Like, and again, yeah. like, and I don't, like, I have a little bit of goosebumps telling it. But, like, when it first happened, I was great, like, really wild about it. Now I'm just kind of, man, what happened there? And And did I... You know, did I just have some weird supernatural 
ghostly paranormal activity and it, it's always it's it's just had me thinking the last little bit yeah. but again nothing threatening nothing like demonic like it was it was all very like peaceful and so i've convinced myself that that was him letting yeah. somebody know like hey but it's just wild that like she said that like no you worked with somebody who who died and i'm like yeah i don't think i'd be at work <laughs> like, yeah. if that happened so no, i've been in similar situations yeah, they were jousting baby <laughs> Like I, I'm always skeptical, but like that story, it just when you the, when you first told me that, I was having a little freak out as well. It's crazy. It's it, it's too many coincidences to just be random. Yeah, no, it was it really yeah it got me thinking. It really really put me on the edge of my seat. And then it was weird because like while I was at the school, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And then as soon as my day was done, and I was it was like I, it all just left. Yeah. And, like, you think when something like that happens, you'd go home and have, like, weird nightmares or anything. But it was, like, any other day after that. Like, Shit. completely yep. out of mind, out of, like, no bad feelings whatsoever. So Yeah. I've had similar situations yeah, up north. It's, it's crazy, man. Like, working up north in the Arctic. Like, I I was chef slash lodge manager at an exploration camp in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. um, plywood shack. Like, everything. We live in plywood huts. Wild. Um, prior to me getting there, a mechanic had gone through the ice in an excavator. It took the military two months to get him out from the bottom of this lake. Um, and, like, from what I understand from people that work with him, he liked quiet breakfast. He liked to get his breakfast, sit there and quiet. He didn't want to answer questions until he at least had a coffee. Um, he was very predominant in the dining room area. If he was bored, he was hanging out in the kitchen. We had two kitchen or two TVs with satellite in the dining room, so that's not out of place. Mm -hmm. But when we were going from exploration to actually opening up the main mine, there was a lot of turmoil. There was a lot of stress and tension because you're trying to move 170 people who are operating currently and moving them th like 30 minutes down the road to a new camp, which means transferring all of their gear and everything over. So there's always a little stress and tension. And while all this was happening... I started experiencing weird things around the dining room, kitchen area, laundry area especially. I had two staff members who were on different rotations and no contact with each other, <laughs> both operating in the same role. They're called general help, which is like a busboy dishwasher in the kitchen. Yeah. Um, they both had experiences where they went to the back of the kitchen, dry storage area, and they both had someone tell them, be quiet. Yeah, see, When that's they were crazy. by themselves to the point where one of my employees wanted to go home. Mm -hmm. she's Inuk, Inuit, like she's like, I heard that and like, no, I'm not working here anymore. I want to go home. Yep. She legitimately quit over it. My other hire was a Somalian kid. He needed to make money. He didn't give a shit. You could tell him to take his pants off in the kitchen. He'd be like, okay. Yeah, cool. Right on, man. I got a paycheck. Yes. Sounds good. No pants. All right. Good times. But then I started experiencing things in the kitchen where I'd be the last one in the kitchen or between rotations or shifts where my night crew hasn't come in yet. I'm in the kitchen or dining room doing payroll or whatever what have you and i'd see somebody walk into the back of the kitchen of the dry storage and i'd go tell them thinking there's somebody new it's like hey man you can't just help yourself yeah and to finding nobody and this happened 10 or 15 times man, man. Yeah. and then it got to a point where like the whole floor is plywood it's like subfloor when you step on subfloor you can tell when somebody's standing behind you mm -hmm. and so like we have this juice machine it's like a giant Kool-Aid machine. You put the crystals in, you put yeah. a certain amount of water in. So I'd be refilling that or something, and I could feel, you could always tell when someone steps behind you because the floor sinks down. So my natural response was take a step forward, and being in the service industry, I'm usually like, oh, I'm sorry, let me get like move closer, only to find out that there's nobody behind me 90% of the time. <coughs> like, what gets spirits like the the biggest rumor out there the <coughs> biggest speculation renovations and change well they and see, that stuff and then there me and my sous chef at the time were talking about moving people and how many people we're gonna have in house yeah and we were both getting kind of annoyed it's like the number is gonna be all over the place how do we dictate what we're feeding yeah like the main camp's supposed to feed 200 people yet but they don't have natural gas so it's like how are they cooking anything and during this conversation a measuring cup flies from the baking department to where my first cook is prepping dinner and it whips past his head and hits the wall behind Not him. a fucking chance I'm saying. And Not he's a like, he goes, what the fuck just happened? I'm like, oh, that's just the guy who died. And like, am I, I'm not, 
I I would say I want to believe. I'm not saying I'm a whole believer, but when weird shit happens, I kind of just accept that it's happening. Yeah. And I do what I can to make the better situation. So my immediate response is like, oh yeah, that's so and so that died. Um, I don't think he's very comfortable with the move. Yeah. And and you and know- I started talking about that, and he's like looking at me like I'm nuts. And then he went and told one of the housekeepers who she's been on site for over 20 years. She's been there for many different owners of the mine. And she goes, oh, I've had lots of experience, but normally with an older elderly woman. Mm-hmm. And she likes to hang out in the laundry areas. So me and her started talking, and then a lot of our stories matched. Yeah. Where somebody was telling housekeepers to be quiet in the laundry room. And yeah. you have to keep in mind, this whole camp is open to the public. There is no staff-only sections. We share all living areas. Oh, mm-hmm. that's cool. So, like, the laundry is the laundry. Everyone shares that area. So if that guy was not a morning person, and he's got, he's doing laundry before he goes to work, he's having breakfast, he doesn't want to talk to people. Yeah. I, I was going to say, a lot of what you're describing, like, if obviously nobody has ghost experiences every day, but if a cup comes flying at you or by you, you're almost going to right away think of it as evil, whereas where you're talking about this guy, you know his personality... It just comes across as he's being grumpy. Yeah, yeah. and I immediately went to grumpy, grumpy, yeah. uh, grumpy miner. So you're not scared. You're just no. like, man, this is some grumpy old man who doesn't like change. And my yeah. first response to calming down my first cook was literally like, yeah, like he's got issues with change. Man. Not that it was some sort of skeptic or talking about ghosts. I'm like, oh yeah, he passed away. He doesn't like change. Yeah. That's the way my first brain went. Like yeah. my first brain. I'd have primal first brain. Thought, yeah. I'd have yeah. machete, like my machete right away. Because they help with ghosts all the time. I, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, by machete, I mean, uh, do you mind grabbing my machete underwear that I have hanging up after experience? <laughs> like, even, even the friends that we share, like, I'm in, I'm in areas where I know people have been eaten by grizzlies, and I have a hunting knife with me, and like, I know that hunting knife is not going to keep me from eating, being eaten by a grizzly, yeah. but very least I'm going to try and poke out an eyeball before I, I get mauled. It's the psychological But support. that's just the way your mentality has to be up there. And mental health is such a thing up there. Like, I've lost so many friends from alcohol abuse or suicide because, like, you get months up there with no sun. I was just going to say, like, up north it's either you have and nothing they, but sunlight or you're in total darkness. Well, they don't have... They have no support system up yeah. there they have all of the luxuries of internet and they see the rest of the world completely alone but then they're trapped up yeah. there alcoholism is a massive problem up there mm-hmm. crack cocaine is a massive problem up there and there's no support infrastructure and like well yeah for every worker like you that's in and out there's uh i haven't seen anything but this my whole life yeah, yeah. which is startling to think of and any and the, the communities up there they don't want their youth going into the big cities because they're not coming back yeah no, so all these sure. communities are dying off yeah no for sure so there is a lot of stress a lot of turmoil a lot of emotions that go through these camps and i to be honest that's the only camp i've ever seen anything um but i believe everything wholeheartedly oh for yeah if i if i didn't experience it i might be a little more on guard but seeing it and feeling it, I 100% believe. I'm not going to say heaven and hell, but I believe there's different dimensions <coughs> and different levels yeah. to the reality that we know. I Yeah, I, I, I definitely do the whole yeah heaven and hell thing. It Definitely when you go down the path of what is speculated the whole like one percent rule where god and the devil came up with a pact where they can't physically manipulate people but that's where you know you get your your serial killers you get your you know bible thumping donate all their paychecks so it's just weird like the both ends of the spectrum and then obviously we're all kind of like in the middle where bigfoot we really want to believe but we want we need the evidence and you need things to actually happen to you which i do too and ever since i had that experience i'm like okay like this is it happened to me this definitely something there so but yeah the whole like annabelle stories and stuff like that like the the warrens i'm a little like fuck off but sure but i i do appreciate it haunted places places that have seen a lot of evil uh, I mean, I've been places in Colombia. Um, to, to, to tell you what, though, because like we could do a whole episode on haunted places. 
We'll get into that Let's next time. Let's cut boys. Let's cut I'm going to say, as when I was in Taganga in Colombia, there's a lost city there where a lot of people were sacrificed, a lot of people died. And just going onto the property without knowing you're on the property, you could feel tension, you can feel death. Even the animals were different. They didn't, they didn't chirp. There was no real singing. And when you got out of the areas of this property where that stuff was prominent, there was definitely, you could tell. Even though it's been hundreds and thousands of years later, there it left its mark. <coughs> That's all I'll say. I was going to say, on that you know, spine on. tingling. If, oh, if, shit. No, no, no. If there's anybody listening that, that made it through this whole episode and you're thinking about ways you can help, even if it's something as little as you know, a buck or whatever towards gas, we will get out to the Nordeg area. Uh, any help is more than what we're getting right now. So <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. I, I got some books here for Gareth. You can borrow those. Let me know uh, what you think. And then that way I have a 100% reason uh, to come back <laughs> and, and we're good. Take us to the Valley of the Headless Men. So also ne- on our sign off, please enjoy these sounds of the only recorded evidence believed to be Bigfoot. Get out of here! Get out of here! (laughs)